Serious what's the worst butterfly effect that you've set off, whether on purpose or on accident? Me spotting a weird light outside my window led to me becoming homeless a couple years later saw a weird light outside our house one night, told mom, it turned out to be my dad calling his mistress divorce mom gets sole custody some time passes my mom is ready to move on and reconnects with an old boyfriend, they decide to go on a trip together, he and my mom end up in a car accident, she dies, I'm just about to turn 18. So I can't go into foster care and my extended family takes her sheet and ditches me homeless it's really weird to think of it this way. I do wonder what would have happened to me, or to her, if something in there had gone differently point at it, so my comment was removed slash hidden. I'm sorry for the trouble, I'll remove the links. And thank you all, so much, truly, for the outpouring of kindness. I wish I could do more for you all, but I'm doing what I can to move forward, at least. I wish you all the best in life, really. Thank you point edition, a picture of my mom, on a date in the 80s, I think. I dug around for the other photos I remember having, but I can't find them, so this one will do. I know you're all strangers, and you didn't know her, but if you want to do something for me, keep her in your thoughts for a moment. There wasn't a funeral, and no one seemed to care at the small memorial my sister held, so I'd always wanted to share a little of her with someone. She deserved better than what happened to her. I have a few of these incidents, but this one in particular really shifted my life in a pretty big way. Point I used to work for an MLM when I was 19. I was doing really well within the organization, and I had a decent trajectory in terms of getting enough people on my team, which would have allowed me to earn six figures. I was stoked. Anyway, one night me and a handful of cowalkers were at a bar drinking and playing golden tea. The bar never carded me, so I had free reign there. One of my cowalkers runs up to me and asks me if he could borrow my car so he and another co-worker could pick up beer at the store. To be honest, I have no idea what their end game was, but I had this really sweet 1991 Toyota MR2 at the time and I loved it. So, I asked him if he was drunk and he assured me he wasn't. So, I gave him my keys cutscene to like 3 minutes later and someone comes running into the bar from outside screaming omg they got into a wreck. So I run outside, and my cowalker had managed to wrap my faking car around a light pole in the bar parking lot. There were two people in my car, which left to head imprints in my windshield. They faking totaled my car unfortunately for me, I only had liability insurance and my cowalker was broke. So, I was faked. No car. I couldn't get to work. Now, mind you, this was in 1999 so there were no Ubers or anything, and because I was having a hard time getting to work, I started running out of money. Finally, I had lost all my motivation to move forward with that job, and found myself carless, jobless, and living in a friend's basement. Point two months later, I joined the Air Force and it completely changed my life's trajectory. All because I trusted some dipshit with my car keys for 3 minutes. Crazy. I would always go up and visit my cousins in New Hampshire. There were 3 of us girls until my aunt and uncle took in their niece, cousin of mine from a different uncle, that a drug problem. She was 1 year older than me. Let's call her Sally. So it ended up being 4 of us from then on point anyway. We would always put on shows and play dress up. We would act, or dance and record them on my mom's VHS recorder. One day we decided to all pretend to be Power Rangers. Since we were all girls, we were very limited to what colors we could be. My older two cousins didn't care, but cousin Sally and myself both wanted to be the Pink Ranger. Little did she know, I had been the Pink Ranger for Halloween, and had packed my costume for this very moment. I went and put it on, and said that, since I had the costume, I'm Kimberly the Pink Ranger. I wore it for 2 days straight and thought I had won the battle point we continued playing for the next few days until my cousin, Sally, decides to stop responding to her name when she's being called. She's in full protest mode now, since I was the pink ranger the days before. She refuses to go by Sally anymore, and is making everyone call her Kimberly. She keeps this going for the remainder of the week I'm there, and my mom convinces me to let her be the pink ranger. I give in and say okay. We go back to my state and I come visit again in the summer. When we go back up a few months later and visit, they are all still calling her Kim. 
Even my grandmother was calling her that. We attempt to play Power Rangers again, and she says she's the Pink Ranger, because her name is Kim. At this point I'm so confused. Turns out she no longer wants to go by Sally anymore and all of the parents slash grandparents agree that it reminds her too much of her unfortunate past, so they are respecting her decision of being called Kim. So from then on, for the rest of my life, she is referred to by everyone as Kim pointed went so far that they actually paid to legally change her name from Sally to Kimberly. So to this day on all government documents, schooling, driver's license, her name is now legally changed to Kim point she one point TLDR, bringing a pink Power Ranger costume caused my cousin to change her name to Kimberly. The Blair Witch Project led to me meeting one of my closest friends and I haven't even seen it point I was an animal control officer out investigating a report of some abandoned animals. The report turned into a big case that ended up with every available officer being called to the scene to help gather evidence, secure the area, etc. That meant that my sergeant got there to get me to do whatever he didn't want to point I had only been on the job a couple of months. So I didn't know anybody all that well, and I was the new guy. The place was a small farm with a big patch of woods on he back of the property. There was enough going on with the farm that the woods had to be searched and cordoned off as a crime scene. My sergeant didn't want to do it because he didn't want to walk into some Blair Witch sheet. So, new guy gets the prize. Nobody knew where the owners of the property were, so I get paired with a partner for safety point my new partner, Presley, name changed because internet, seemed cool. I thought I'd heard him mention a street fighter tournament, which stood out in a department of good old boys. I'd never taken the chance so get to know him, though, as 80% of our calls and paperwork were handled solo point, so color me surprised when, as I'm wrapping police tape around a tree, I hear dearly beloved start to play. This gentle piano piece is the theme to the first Kingdom Hearts game, one of my favorite series of games of all time. Point Presley is scrambling to drop the tape and pull out his phone and mute the call. He's apologizing profusely, since we technically aren't allowed to have person phones on his. I assure him that I give zero facts and love his choice of ringtone. We get talking about KH, then games as a whole, and generally begin to feel less miserable about what turned into a 15 hour shift. He and his wife joined our D&D group, we team up for smash tourneys, and he is set to be my groomsman in the summer all, because a ranking officer was scared of some Maryland woods. As many of the responses don't actually fit the question, I'll add mine point I casually mentioned I didn't want to move to Texas, and my husband now has an amazing job that relocated us to Michigan point years ago, my husband hated his job, I hated it for him. We were living in Florida, and he had basically topped out with his career locally. His workplace was figuratively toxic, and he is talented and skilled, so got occasional job offers that would require relocation. Point one was to a job in Texas. He mentioned it offhand, and I joked, well, we'll miss you, because no way in fact am I moving to Texas. I even laughed, because I was teasing. I didn't hear much else about that job and figured it had fallen through if it had proceeded. We would have had to talk logistics about relocation and such point a couple years later, he mentions not taking that job stalled out his career. Wait, what? Well, he explains, I had said no and shut it down. I tell him I didn't, that I was joking, that we should have actually talked about it point he ends up quitting his awful job and starts a company with friends, but he is now in a massive depressive state and doesn't enjoy the company, so looks for other work. He takes another off brand job as kind of a favor to a friend and gets bought out of the company he helped start, by his request. And continues at this off brand job for 3 months, when he hears about his dream job. He dismisses it, doesn't even apply. They contact him a couple months later, as someone within the company suggested him. It ends up taking another 6 months or so, and he gets this dream job. In Michigan point he had been suggested for the position by someone who he had worked with at the toxic company point. If I hadn't dismissed Texas, he probably wouldn't have worked with her, and she wouldn't have suggested him for the dream job, and we wouldn't be in Michigan, we would either be in Texas, or still in Florida. Technically I don't know that my response was a deciding factor, but the timing is suspect. 
Also, this is was a while ago, so I likely have a few details wrong point get a call from my uncle, who I haven't spoken to in years. Turns out he is married now. Turns out he has been in a mental asylum, I didn't know at the time, and met his wife in the same asylum, she was a patient. His wife comes to the phone says she is having trouble with religion and her relationship to Jesus, and my uncle recommended talking to me, because I was such a devout Christian. At this point, I'm an outright Luciferian, and haven't been a Christian for years. I recommend talking to someone else about it as I'm pretty much the opposing team xd she is quiet and hangs up point a few days later, they come back to the UK from the states. They are making a tour, introducing her to family. She meets with my great aunt, a woman kind and polite enough that the Pope would be asking her for advice on compassion. My great aunt doesn't have coca cola in the house. My aunt is enraged by this and pulls a knife on my great aunt, having to be restrained by my uncle. They go to my grandparents house like nothing had happened. Obviously my traumatized great aunt calls ahead to warn them. My grandparents confront them, much to the offense of my aunt and uncle. My aunt proceeds to run upstairs, sheet into a plastic bag, and leave it on my grandmother's bed. She then goes out the window and runs away. Last I heard of her, she had been spotted by the police in the north of Scotland point again. I don't know if the insane events that transpired would have gone differently if I had been able to talk to her, but suffice to say she snapped again. I finally have a chance to tell this story. I'll try to not make a novel of it, but I apologize in advance for the wall of text, but here is my tale. Stopped by my parents house one Saturday afternoon, nobody was home. I had an encounter that resulted in my dad getting fired from his job and the eventual downfall of the company he worked for I was on my way out to hang with friends for the night and figured I would stop by my parents house to say hi. My parents were away for the weekend at a conference related to my father's work, which I didn't know, but will turn out to be an important piece of the story. I think I saw my sister for a bit before she went out. Since I had time to kill I decided to hang around. I was in the office in the basement when I glanced to my side and saw somebody peering through the window into the room across the hall. The house was out in the woods and this window was in the back of the house, under the deck. I got up and he waved and indicated that he was heading to the door I got upstairs and looked outside but could not see any car in the driveway. The driveway was a semicircle and there was only a very small area that could not be seen from the house. Anybody coming to he house would normally park right in front, not the one small area where a car couldn't be seen. Point the guy approached asking for my father by name and said he worked with him while pointing out that he was wearing a company shirt. He told me that he had given the guys a little holiday gift, but my dad wasn't there. Remember when I said he was at a work-related conference, and since he was in the neighborhood he decided to stop by and drop it off. I was so confused by all this, I didn't call him out on any of his bullshit. He was empty-handed, and my parents' house wasn't in a neighborhood. Nobody was ever just in the neighborhood. There was nothing around that anybody might just be passing by. You had to make a effort to go there. I offered to make sure he got the gift that this guy didn't have on him, and he said he had to get it from his car. At least now I got to see where he hid his car. He reached in and came back out with a small gift pack of jams and jellies or something like that, commented on how his wife forgot to fill out the card, and then took out a pen and signed it. He then gave it to me, asking to let my dad know he stopped by and left point the whole encounter seemed so bizarre that I had no idea what to say. I left the gift on the counter and went on with my day. The next night I called home and while talking to my mom I mentioned the gift. She immediately sounded very agitated and said tell me what the hell that was all about. So I told her the story of the guy that didn't ring the doorbell but was instead peering in a back window under the deck. He said he was passing by and wanted to drop off the gif that he meant to give a few days earlier, even though he didn't have it on him and the card wasn't signed. I could hear her on the other end of the line saying things like what an asshole. She then informed me that he was my father's boss slash owner of the company and he certainly knew they weren't home since they were at a conference point next day my always cool, never yelling dad showed up to work, stormed into the boss's office and let him have it about how much of a creep he was because he knew my parents were away and my 20 year old sister was home alone for the weekend. 
told him to stay away from our family and a good amount of swearing at him. When he left the guy's office, everybody in the place was staring and wondering what happened to cause all that. Later in the day my dad was informed that his contract would not be renewed at the end of the year and he should pack his things and go home early point I felt bad about it at this point, but my parents told me that the guy had a reputation as a bit of a creep and dad was thinking about leaving, so this event would have been the last straw anyway. He also had places reaching out to him about jobs by the time he got home, so he got to take an extended vacation and start fresh in a few weeks I thought this was the end of the story, until almost a year later, when I was visiting I heard my father having a conversation with a former co-worker from the other job. I asked if he was still poaching former workers, and he said he couldn't take any more, but was sending them elsewhere. Then channeling Paul Harvey, he told me the rest of the story point short version of the aftermath. Word got out after the incident and several prominent accounts dropped them and went elsewhere, as did a few workers. The other owner decided he wanted out and there was a court battle over forcing a buoy out in the building which belonged to the good owner. Good owner then joined forces with the company my dad was at, and they achieved much success. One day while I was 18 I was at a party and there were probably 200 or so minors, and like two people 21 plus and cops showed up, later to find out they were looking for fireworks being shot off in the neighborhood, we didn't know this, me and a few friends run, hop the walls and run from cops and helicopters hide in the bushes, and end up getting to my car, and going to another party in another neighborhood down the street. Originally I didn't want to go to the second one as the first party was at a good friend's house and I didn't know anyone at the second except the two people I drove there. So sometime later these dudes want me to drive then like 2 to 3 miles down the road and back to pick up girls and come back. I was the only one with a car slash license. I kept saying no but they would not let up. Eventually gave in and left with them. We got pulled over right outside the neighborhood by three cops side by side in the middle of the road at 3 in the morning. Because I had a license plate light out. Led to me getting a DUI. Blue point zero two, But got it cause I was 18. And one of the others in the car had a warrant for being a runaway. It faked my life up and I've been screwed since this was in late June 2012 and I still have not been financially capable of recovering from this. Arizona is literally the worst for DUI not to mention they searched my car without consent, pulled me out and started searching immediately well before ever being given a field sobriety test but I was young and naive and didn't realize that when I went to court. This may not be the worst as ops intention, but this is hell of a story of my life. Since it spans a long time frame, I'll just write the milestone super short backstory. I was a pretty bullied and emotionally faked up little man when it all started. My first serious girlfriend also wrecked me up pretty badly. I also had a serious case of dance phobia and lack of confidence point my friend invited me to watch Scott Pilgrim vs the world. After watching the movie a lot of things made sense and I decided to mend myself point after some time I had a crush on a girl from the orchestra I'm playing with. With my newly acquired knowledge and half confidence I opened myself up. She looked like interested, but she's one of the most sinister and passive manipulative people I've met. She completely wrecked me. Slowly and surely. Then throws me away like a well squeezed orange point this triggered all my damage and instability from my middle school years and related bullying. I started to destabilize further and further. Decided I need therapy point therapy fixed most things. But, not all. I was on my feet now. Left the therapy with the words maybe I leave and dance someday point I somehow met with one of my old friends in one of the orchestra concerts. Things progressed and I proposed. We've engaged, but, in the last two months things got super bad. she become stubborn and her family tried to use and exploit me. I've burned all the bridges and called everything off in a 5 minute phone call and left for a vacation. I got a car in my home and renovated it in the process. Coincidentally and subconsciously I've built my dream house. As a bonus, most of the things I've dreamed about are also present in it. Being abused emotionally broke a wall inside me, and I started to grow stronger somehow. I also started to lose my excess weight. Point one night after dinner, I decided that I'll try dancing. I went one of the better tango studios and got enrolled. Point two weeks later, one of my close friends sent an email about meditation. 
I've met with the teacher and decided to start. I wanted to learn meditation since I was a teen by the way. Today, I've completed my PhD, dancing in advanced tango class, and I'm a level 1 meditation instructor. I transformed from a wimpy and slightly overweight computer nerd to someone completely different. Just because I watched Scott Pilgrim vs. The World and moved point thanks for reading this far PS, the story might have some holes and it's open for discussion. You may ask anything. I decided to move out because my mother was abusive when I was 19. Took my brother, 17, with me to save him. He had lost his job training, so he had no money to pay his part of rent. We could barely make it point two months later I met my now boyfriend. My brother only sat in his room, drank alcohol and smoked weed. Refused to get a job or clean after himself. Didn't accept help offers from me. Threatened to hurt me if I didn't give him money and eventually acted on it. Point I moved in with my boyfriend that evening and told my brother he had a month to get his things packed and move. He stayed with a friend while we took in his stuff in the cellar. I meet my brother one last time at my grandma's birthday party. It actually goes well, of course, because he is absolutely drunk. Point two months forward, I get threats via WhatsApp and cut complete contact. He doesn't want to move his stuff out, my boyfriend and I want to move into a bigger apartment, so it had to get out. We sell at point my boyfriend and I are moving and doing everything possible, so he does not find out our new address. It's a new start. My brother congratulates me on my birthday. I answer him, and only find out 3 months later, that my text never got, sent from my phone. My mom tells me he's got a new job training, and a little apartment for himself. I don't care, because I don't want my brother in my life anymore. Although I never told him this, it's November 13th 2019, 10pm and my mom is at my door. My boyfriend is working. Behind her is my cousin, a huge man I don't really have any contact to. Something's wrong, I can feel it, your brother took his life, my mom says, before she can even come in, and starts to cry point he never wrote us a letter or something, but texted his dad, that he always destroys everything. My brother had lost another possible job, couldn't pay rent and apparently had no reason to live anymore point had I not convinced him to move out there wouldn't have been a need for him to make money or pay rent. Although he refused to move in with any family members, after getting kicked out by me, so I guess it was his decision to live like that too. I think I found this late enough for this comment to get buried, but this one really resonated with me for a long time and it's a little convoluted. This one gets a little dark point I grew up in abusive household and ultimately went into foster care in the middle of this whole scenario. But my point is that I made some shitty decisions at the time and didn't always consider the consequences of my actions. I had a close friend my freshman year in high school, we'll call her A, and this takes place the beginning of February of that school year. A and I lived on essentially the same road, just maybe half a mile apart with a road intersecting our individual roads. That road leads out to a main highway and is the only direct path from her house to our high school. We walk to school together almost every day. If I was up early enough, I would even walk to her house first, and we'd head out together from there. Sometime prior, an old friend, Jay, and his mom had realized my walk was along their route, and by proxy, so was A's. I started getting rides, and so did A. Valentine's Day was coming up, and Jay wanted to find something for his girlfriend from the mall, and invited me along to hang out, and help him pick something out. Enter the bad decision. I did a bit of light shoplifting during this time and I tried lifting a few things from a shop and unfortunately got caught. The value wasn't enough to prosecute me, but was enough to hold me until a parent could pick me up. There wasn't any way to get out of the situation without Jay and of course, his mother, finding out what happened. They were rather wholesome, religious, and I was no longer welcome to hop in the car and get a ride to school. Since they only got picked up, because picking me up slightly altered the route, she lost the ride as well Friday, February 13th, I was walking to school, and A and I were arguing about something inconsequential, and I was being a moody teenager, and didn't feel like walking up the hill to A's house, and just ended up walking straight to school. I had a gut feeling to go get her, but I ignored it in favor of laziness and vague pettiness. 
apparently, or actually went out of her way to get me that morning, and when no one was at my house, instead of walking back down my road towards where we would meet up and head to school together, she walked around my house and down that street that does also lead directly to the highway. However, it's a very low traffic street at this time of day and there are no houses between mine and the highway pointer barely made it past the edge of my property on the side road heading towards the highway when someone saw her alone. I was 14 when she was abducted from outside my own home. She was raped and murdered that day and we didn't know what happened to her for over a year 13 months later, her skeletal remains were found. As much as I know there's no way a 15 year old child is responsible for that man's actions he himself called it a crime of opportunity. He only turned around and approached her because she was alone in a fairly secluded place. She wouldn't have been there if I hadn't been stupid and gotten caught stealing. She wouldn't have been alone if I had just walked with her every single day prior. I know it's not my fault, but every part of this was extremely hard to process and accept as it happened. Point no TLDR. It feels too fleshed out, even though that's the point edit. Spelling slash grammar. I agreed to help a woman find her stolen car. In the end I'd go crazy and lose custody of my kid. Point the story goes like this. I was a straight edge 17 years old with a bright and glowing future. After many a night aimed chatting with a friend I decided to drive out to meet, said friend in the middle of the BFE. While at her house no more than 5 minutes, a woman shows up. Dusty. All the moth of faking fates aligned. She smiled and asked for help. God damn it I was in. Her car had been stolen by a meth dealer in the area. We went looking. And I got high. Several months later, after dropping out of school, running away from home, Catching a bunch of charges. We never find the car. But. She steals my car. Then the dealer. Who originally stole Dusty's car. Helps me find my car. Find it. But cops are there. And I'm still classified as a runaway. So it goes back to my fam. Fam decides that I'm too faked up to handle. So they sign guardianship over to my current road dog slash dealer. Once I'm 18 and have effectively trashed every relationship I've had, I choose to sleep with my part-time boyfriend's mother's bisexual boyfriend and end up pregnant. While my actual boyfriend is banging some old broad and absconding from his PO. As time to give birth comes my old man gets locked up, I fall for some crazy bird while trying to get sober. Day of delivery comes I bone out of town. Hope to never return. Unfortunately, meth is hard to quit and parents can be difficult. I go back a year later and blow up my life. End up sending my kid to fam temporarily and fighting ensues. In trying to see the kid I work a job as a coyote. Get busted do fed time. Go to rehab. Realize I have lots of mental health issues. Get cleaned up. Help start several sober living homes. Get in great relationship. Get ready to get kid back. Break my back. Get put on pain meds. Go insane. Try to kill myself. Now I'm picking up the pieces again point I have reached out to Dusty in the last two years. Without her this path would not have happened. I would be something completely different. But my kid would also not be here. So. One choice. Saying yes that night lead me to today. Also I never did talk to that original friend again. Rather playing on an online forum having horrible trust issues, self-destructive tendencies, and a hard time being close to people romantically I'll try to keep it relatively short cause it spans like a little over 11 years. So I used to rather play when I was a freshman in high school on this online forum thing called Javier Online. Randomly I got this private message from some random girl and we start rather playing. We start talking to each other and learn each other's names. Lots of personal info, yada yada. Giving my personal info to some rando on the internet. I know, I was such a smart kid point well. Turns out it wasn't actually an adult. It really was someone around my age. We were both depressed, lonely outcasts and we started dating. I was excited. My first girlfriend. Sure, we lived, like halfway across the country from each other, and we were both in high school but it's fine. Now, I was a very gullible kid. I took everything at face value. I didn't think highly of myself, so I figured, whenever someone who was even remotely kind to me suggested something, it was fine. They were doing what was best, I mean I didn't have friends. 
how would I know how other people acted? Right? Right. Well, it led to us dating for about 3 years. She convinced me to do a lot of shit I hate myself to this day for. She pressured me to do things sexually I didn't want to do, but figured I ought to because I didn't want to be selfish. Constantly said she wanted an open relationship and wanted to let her be physical with other guys because she'd be thinking of me and she only truly loved me. Lied about horrible things like being wrapped and used it as a weapon against me. Even if it wasn't a lie, she still held it over my head like it was my fault. She broke up with me and brought me back whenever she wanted, handed me off to a friend when she was done with me, told me she'd kill herself if we ever broke up. Long story short she basically broke me mentally so I would do whatever she wanted, built me back up and broke me over and over. And I went along with it for years. I just thought that's what love was. It wasn't until she let me go and I dated other people I realized what kind of damage she did to me. I cheated on a girl I dated just because she said she wanted me back, lashed out at people who tried to show me genuine love. Closed myself off, the friends I did make I would keep at arm's length. The worst part was when I realized I became just as bad as she was I'm glad I have my girlfriend now that's helping me get through this and helping me understand what a healthy and loving relationship is actually like, encouraging me to make my own choices and that I'm finally able to tell myself yeah, you faked up but you can move on and be better point remember, you are worth more and you are no one's object. No one who loves you says they won't let you leave them. You deserve love and deserve someone who loves you. If who you are with treats you like an object or a toy, doesn't respect you, and treats you like you need to do whatever they say, run. Get out of there. A buddy of mine came back to New York to visit family and friends. He had been married a few years at this point. I was single and very socially active. I told him he had to come out bar hopping with me one night for a guy's night out. He agrees. I take him out to the first bar that was close to my place. I had gone there almost every night of the week for at least two years, so everyone in the bar knew me, and when they would see my carpool in the parking lot, they would start pouring me a Guinness, and it would be waiting for me on the bar by the time I walked in. So me and my buddy walk in the door and the bouncer says hey big Dave, we pay no cover, a few of my female friends come over and say hi and give hugs. I introduce my buddy. Bartender leans over the bar, gives me a hug and a kiss on the cheek, I introduce my friend, she gives him first beer on the house. A few more of my friends show up, and we have a great time. He ends up not having a bar tab because me, my friends, and the bartender keep buying him his drinks he and I bail, and go to another bar. We get a warm welcome, and talk to a few more people I know, but not nearly the same as the first place. After a few more drinks, we go to a strip joint where my ex-girlfriend bartends. We remained good friends after our breakup. Again, pay no cover, uncommon in New York, hug and kiss from my ex, free beers, and I introduce him to several of the strippers I knew. I buy him a private dance and the girl gives him three extra songs worth, since he's my friend. After a few hours, we leave with phone numbers and the girl's real names. He's loving every minute of it and hated that we had to bail. I take him home and tell him I'll catch up with him tomorrow. The rest of the visit was an eventful point a few months later he divorces his wife and when I ask why, he flat out tells me it was because of that night and he wanted to live life like that point tldr. Took a married buddy out for a guy's night and he divorces his wife shortly thereafter. When I was 16 I was playing Medal of Honor. I needed to kill the bad guys, but instead I listened to them talking, because that unknown language sounded really beautiful, I didn't know much about WWII. After that I killed them, finished the game and googled it to find out about the language. I feel in love with the language, and started learning it by myself. Some years later, I started university, but I was studying French, and didn't like it so much, so I decided to go to another university, where I would study German. I got in, and one day I saw a job announcement on their website. I applied, got the job, and met a Russian girl, it happened in Brazil. We fell in love, but she needed to go back to Russia. After that, I told her, that my dream was to go to Germany, but it was hard. She helped me a lot, and I finally got to go there as an AU pair. 
I was living in Munich, but the family was complicated, so I left them and found a new family in Cologne. Some months before, the Russian girl was trying to be an AU pair in Sweden, but it didn't work out, so she tried other countries. Some months later, she became an AU pair in Paris. Around 4 hours away from Cologne, so we met again. One year later, we decided to come back to Brazil together and get married. It happened in 2015, and we are still together so, if it wasn't for Hitler, the war, Steven Spielberg making Saving Private Ryan, people creating the game and my father buying me a computer, I would probably have never gotten into the best Brazilian university, I wouldn't have met my wife and I wouldn't have gone to Germany. Having a marijuana pipe and my car led to my daughter being born and other craziness with my in-laws I was pulled over and busted for a weed pipe and my car. Long story short I did 60 days in jail. Got out of jail and had to live with my parents for a couple of months to get a job and get back on my feet. I got a job at cooking at a large chain Italian restaurant. I moved in with a coworker. My coworker had a birthday party for his daughter. The birthday parties for his kids would be afternoons for the kids, all night grown up partying. Another co-worker brought her sister to the party. The sister and I hooked up. The sister and I started a long term relationship and are now married. Here's the list of crazy shit our family has been through. Before I met my wife her previous husband committed suicide. I raised dead guy's daughter as my own. My wife and I had a daughter of our own after 4 years. Her grandfather died before our daughter was born. Her father had a stroke right after that, now requires 24 hour care. Her sister and her fiance were killed in a head on collision on Thanksgiving within a year of my daughter's birth. Their son miraculously survived the accident. Approximately a year after her sister's death we were married. Custody of our nephew who survived the air accident was given to his father's sister and husband. Nephew's new parents broke all promises of allowing us in his life. My father-in-law, who has relied on his wife for everything got, caught calling a woman who my mother-in-law suspected he had an affair with. He then admitted to a 17-year affair with the woman. My mother-in-law was forced to continue caring for him because of financial reasons she can't afford to divorce the man. Our nephew's grandparents sued their own daughter for custody due to emotional and physical neglect and were awarded custody. I had foot surgery this August was out of work for 7 months for the whole ordeal. Our oldest, my adopted, had to have open heart surgery and have a LVAD heart pump installed. An LVAD is not a mechanical heart, but a pump that does the job of the left chamber. Before surgery she had liver and kidney failure which almost killed her. She was on dialysis and the doctors were forced to install the pump, even though she was literally dying. She was in the hospital for 2 months 400 miles away. My wife and her mother stayed in the city throughout the hospitalization requiring me to provide my father-in-law's care while I was still recovering from surgery. Our daughter and everyone else is home now and she's doing amazingly well point so, having a weed pipe and being searched due to the cop smelling marijuana, which I'm pretty sure was bullshit but oh well, led me to a 60 day jail sentence and placed me on the path that led me to where I am. I wouldn't change a thing, I love my wife and kids and all things considered, have a great life despite the family tragedies. Thank for reading my TLDR. No one's gonna see this, and it'll get buried, but this one makes me laugh so hard, that I wanna write it point family was in Rarotonga for my brother's wedding, and sister at the time, was dating her drug dealer, who everyone in the family hates. He was warned to stay away from the family because he's also a woman beater I brought my friend along and instead of staying in the large rental house we had our own small room closer to the airport. We went to the large house where my family was and there was a figure sitting in a running car outside that I couldn't quite see so I ignored. I then went back to the car for a forgotten item and saw the woman beating drug dealing boyfriend. We called him Prawn. I walked back to everyone thinking he was invited and asked the innocent question, how long has Prawn been here? The following played out everyone gets up in shock, wondering when he got their brother who has a limp asks friend to piggyback him out to the car brother punches him while he's in the car in the face. 
Then Prawn gets out of the car and gets his ass beat by my brother sister sees the fight and starts yelling at my brother trying to fight him sister then turns to my mother and they start fighting other sister comes out confused and mother starts yelling at her. She then threatened my mother brother friend who gave him the piggyback sees the prawn try and sneak a punch. So he gets dropped everyone calms down and starts blaming me that I started everything point they are not wrong though. If I didn't say anything nothing would have happened. But my family are Rylander and Maori, so physical violence plus toxic family equals a good time. My fiancé at the time had a friend we jokingly set up with my little sister for a date. Turns out they ended up liking each other and eventually got engaged as well. We all ended up getting married, but I found out a few months later my now wife's friend has been beating my little sister. She wouldn't say anything at first, but she lived next door to a nurse I worked with who told me should, could hear screaming from their house almost every night. I had also noticed bruising on her arms, but she would explain away like their dog had jumped on her, or she had fallen down the steps. I go to their house and ask her if she's being abused, and she broke down and told me everything. I sent her to my parents, housed in my car, and waited for her husband to get home. The look on his face I'll never forget as he comes yelling up the stairs for her, only to find me waiting in his bedroom. We had it out, and I beat the sheet out of him, before throwing him down the staircase, like he'd done to my sister before. I go home in her car and find my wife in hysterics, because her friend had called her on my way home telling her how my sister had lied, and I had beaten him up. I explained to my wife all of the evidence I had, and that I knew he had done all this terrible sheet to my little sister. She went to her parents that night and nothing I could say would make her change her mind about her friend. Me and my sister both ended up with divorces, definitely for the best, but I hate myself for causing all that grief because me and the ex-wife thought it would be funny to set her up on that blind date. This was going to be r slash pro revenge, but since I post here quite often, this question fits well with the story I'm about to share. Point I met a girl 4 years ago at a church I once helped as a gospel bassist in Canada. She was a former exchange student from Mexico, and she is a guitarist slash pianist gospel singer. Very talented, and very beautiful. Things were working pretty well the entire summer, until she had to leave town for Bible college located in the far east side. We kept in touch, but things were starting to go rocky with a dumb decision I made point in November. She suddenly began to feel very depressed, and she would tell me about how she really missed her parents and I feel, so alone kind of depression. Not seeing the red flag at the time, I just told her to pray, and let God be her comfort. This part of the story will be important later. December came, and she asked me if she can borrow $175 for sending a gift to her mom and idiot me, not seeing where this is going, gave her $200 instead. A week later, and she tells me that she's in Mexico. She told me that her father paid for her flight. Once again, I didn't see where this was going until early January, when she posted up photos of her going out with another guy point that devastated me. It took me several days to get myself together until began to plan my breakup and not only that, tell the people who sponsored her about what happened. So February came and I confronted her and just said that we were done and when I told her about the man she was with, she didn't have none else to say. I told her sponsors afterwards and she flipped out on me, but I never texted her back. This was the last time we would see each other. Point fast forward to 2020, after just devoted myself to music and exercising my faith, with God's help, my mother and I started our own business, we got our first mortgage, and our first new car. My mother has been the greatest life coach to me, and she helped see the red flags that were happening to me. Point as for her, the $200 choice to Mexico costed her the chance to stay in Canada. She couldn't renew her work permit, and in 2018, she went off the grid. So much so, that her sponsors MSG me her whereabouts. It wasn't long, before I found out, that she went off the grid, because she had severe depression. She found out, that the guy she wanted to be with is now in a relationship with another woman and that destroyed her. And she now lives back in Mexico, still single, and still trying to date other guys, but with no success. If I didn't give her the money, I would still be manipulated to be with her while she is seeing other men. 
I'd probably try to propose her because I fell in love with her. Now that I saw her ugly side and her true face. I'm glad that my stupid choice shed some light to what was going to be a very toxic relationship. It was really my friend's actions that set it off, but involves me point about 7 years ago I was talking to a guy over messenger we both had mutual friends, but had never officially met each other, he often said he wanted to take me out, but I was never really feeling it. For about a week he was constantly asking me to go to the movies and drinks with him, but I always made an excuse as to why I couldn't go. One day I was at a close friend's house when he messaged asking me again, and she convinced me I should just give it a shot, because I might actually like him, so I caved in and agreed to give it a shot. The night of the date I didn't want to go I was at her place getting ready and again she practically forced me out the door. The date was okay he seemed quiet and reserved pretty harmless. We see a lot of each other over the next few weeks and eventually he shows up at my place and just never really left again he integrated himself into my life. Fast forward 2 years and I'm still in a relationship with this guy, but it's literally the worst relationship I've ever been in. He was controlling, he was abusive emotionally and physically I was trapped or that's how it felt at the time. It took me a further 2 years to get away from home and in the process I lost everything, my home. My furniture, my friends everything I had nothing but I finally had my freedom from him point she still feels bad about it claiming if she had never made me go on that date none of it would have happened to me. I don't blame her at all and afterwards my life turned around I met an amazing guy who pretty much saved my life and showed my how I deserve to be treated and helped me build my life back up again. In some weird twisted way, if she hadn't pushed me out the door that night I wouldn't be where I'm now. So I'm kinda grateful, even if I would have preferred to get here in a better way. Summer of 2000, I was 9 years old, and I loved to read. There was this one book, I'd owned it for a few months, and had started to read it, but that first chapter bored me to tears, so I stopped it. But it was summer break and eventually I ran out of books to read, so I pick that one back up. I still didn't like the first chapter, but this time I continued to read it anyways. After a couple chapters, my opinion shifted hard. I adored this book. It only took me a couple days to finish it. It has a sequel, and it takes me a few weeks to track it down, but I eventually get it, as well as the third book in the series. I start fourth grade and make a new friend on my first day. She's read these books too, and a fourth book had recently come out. She gives me a copy for my birthday. We read it together it's Harry Potter a movie comes out and my 11th birthday party is my parents taking me and my friends to see it point when I'm 12, I get access to the internet and discover message boards. I post with people about what we think the 5th book will be, characters, plot theories. I discover fun fiction. I discover the concept of internet anonymity and make up a new persona for myself, the me I wish I could be I roll. The only person who knows my alias is that best friend who gave me the fourth book point I make several friends online, and some of those friendships entirely changed the trajectory of my life. Some of those friendships were short lived, sometimes people would log out and never log back in. Or change usernames and forget to share it with their friends. I lost track of people. People lost track of me. Maybe some of them just got tired of me point one of them didn't get tired of me. We remained friends, even after he mostly outgrew HP, I never did. We took our friendship off the message boards and onto instant messengers. Then Miss Bass, Facebook, the phone. I developed a huge crush on him, but I knew it would never work. He lived 800 miles away. I was 17 when a friend, who had guessed at my crush, pretended to be me over AIM and confessed my love for him. I never told him it wasn't me, because he responded with I love you too. Fuck it. We are meeting in person. We are going to make this a real relationship and it's going to work. It'll be beautiful point he takes a greyhound over 24 hours to come visit me. We meet. It is as magical as we had hoped. He stays a week and then leaves. He comes again a few months later. He asks me to move in with him. He asks me to marry him. We get engaged and the same week I graduate high school, I move 800 miles. All because of iBook I only read out of desperate on point tldr. I read a book I wasn't interested in, and then I moved halfway across the country. 
I'm also still very close friends with a girl I met 20 years ago. Probably the only one and most recent point it goes back to April 2019 related to one of Etika's streamer mental breakdowns. I had heard and watched a couple of Etika's videos before this happened, but since I was a psychology student at the time I got interested as to what was happening to him. He wasn't diagnosed at the time point I checked his official reddit page, right when he got into the psychiatric hospital, this happened around the time the police went to his apartment. He was doing a Q&A, and I told him that it was okay to believe he was a god. But to please get better and stay safe, something along those lines. He actually replied and thanked me. Now, this was around May 2nd. I received dozens of down votes since his fan base was calling him a clown back then, and to me too, I suppose point I joined one of the biggest Etika discord servers back then, to try to talk some sense into people, since they were making some weird conspiracies, but his mental health was bad, and he just needed some words of positivity back then. People started hating me for it too, but I actually met there my soon to be boyfriend. I stayed on the server either way, but didn't talk much. Now it's June 7th. I started dating the boyfriend because of Etika. End of June, Etika kills himself and everybody starts feeling bad for calling him a clown. I'm still dating that boyfriend 8 months later. I live in Central America and he lives in the United States. We are meeting in June it's a bittersweet butterfly effect, but I will always be grateful that Etika left me with something positive in my life that I so badly needed point rest in peace. We miss you. Had been a divorced single mom with no time or energy to bother with dating for about 8 years. Saw an early guy interviewed on a TV show's tech spotlight, thought he was cute, and promptly forgot all about it. Few days later the tech spotlight was a project related to something I was doing at work, so I decided to look it up on the show's website point in the process, ran across the link to the cute nerds website. It was a rare quiet day at work, and I was bored, so I clicked it. Found out his site had a web chat, and decided to while away the hour or so until work ended there. Ended up making friends with some other women about my age, who were hanging out in the chat. Started chatting with them fairly regularly point site owner I'd seen interviewed work nights, while I worked days, so it was a while, before I finally happened to be online when he was. Probably about 6 weeks. Decided it was only polite to thank him for the use of his resources and doomed him with that point he could tell by my IP address I lived nearby, so he started chatting me up. It had been so long since I'd expended any time or energy on dating, or even getting to know someone it took a couple of weeks before I realized maybe this guy's trying to chat me up point we ended up meeting at a tech talk a couple of weeks later, dated, and married on the anniversary of our first meeting 3 years later. We've been together almost 20 years now, and it has been the best years of our lives, but for one random boredom click. Ooh, I have a good one. When I was 5 or 6 my dad was taking down one of those wooden backyard playgrounds for the winter. All the wood, with nails sticking out of them, was haphazardly piled against a tree. I thought he would be super proud of me if I climbed it to the top, so I did. When I called his name to show him, he must have panicked, but he calmly walked over and picked me up. As he did so, he stepped on a nail, and it went right through his foot. He didn't even react, just calmly kept walking and put me down inside. My dad is a type 1 diabetic and foot injuries are very serious, I believe because they have extremely bad circulation. Cue his doctors trying to save his foot slash leg, if it went gangrene, it would need to be amputated. They did it, but it took a year of bed rest, then crutches, and he missed a lot of work point during his 4 to 6 months off recovering a promotion came up at work that he had been lined up for for ages. But, he was gone for an indefinite period of time, so they promoted the girl he'd be training to take over his job point because of this. Soon after his return he was making too much for his current level and his job was restructured. He became a stay at home dad for a while, since my mom traveled like crazy for her job point eventually, my mom and dad realized that her job was too much for the family. She made the bold decision 
to leave and start her own company, and my dad got a job in a different city, so we all had to move, and my mom started her business there. Point the girl who got promoted instead of my dad is now in his dream position and making huge amounts of money, so I always felt a little bad point until one of them, can't remember which, told me one day, when I brought it up, that their marriage was really struggling due to them both being so busy all the time and the stress. If my dad had gotten that promotion, it would have gotten worse, and they probably would have divorced before she decided to finally leave her job. So I lost my dad his dream job and 300k plus salary, but I saved my parents' marriage. All because at 6 years old I climbed some sheet point. That was 22 years ago, and our lives would probably have been entirely different in almost every way. This one hurts, needed to get it off my chest for a while point a bit over a year ago, I was working my current job, I was new, and they hired this other dude, we hit it off really well, he was super cool, we were both kicking ass at the job, type of stuff, where 5 years later we could both be running our own team, lot of potential, and he honestly was a great dude. Everyone thought so point fast forward, after about a year of him working, he'd share stuff about his life with me. He gets an offer to do something he was super passionate about, but was a huge pay cut. He said he'd already talked to his wife, worked at the same company just totally different department, never met her, and she was cool. So I told him go for it, how many get a chance to be paid at all for our passions. He takes the job, we bid him best of luck point he texts me a few months later, tells me the job fell through due to some unforeseen politics, asks me to help get him back in. I said I'd try. Didn't hear from him for a month, eventually found he had a close family member on their last. Told me he needed time, said sure. Family member passed, went to the service, gave what comfort I could point about a month later. He actually comes in for an interview, I worked with the contractors, to get him a better rate, all seems well. Tells me he was living in an apt instead of his house, figured there was trouble since his wife wasn't at the funeral, but decided I'd leave it. Then suddenly, something falls through and basically boss says background check failed point then he texts me a few weeks later, saying he got back in the company, different department, and we should catch up. We're all hyped, then I don't hear from him point a few weeks later he told me that his wife had put a restraining order on him, never told me why, and when she saw him at the office, she got him fired. So now he's doing odd job, and won't ever get in again. I honestly don't have the heart to ask for the details, but I can't see anything worse than desperate people make mistakes I know he's responsible for his own sheet, and I don't know the whole story, but damn do I wish I could go back and tell him to take the safe and stable decision. Like some answers here, this is more like the biggest, rather than the worst, but here goes 4 years ago I was starting my second year studying computer science. My two best friends had moved out of town, and they were the only ones I really kept contact with since high school. I had acquaintances from class, but for me that didn't count. I was pretty shy, not really talkative, and had a pretty severe lack of self esteem point anyway, the dorms where I lived didn't let you cook in your room, so we had to use the common kitchens. I usually eat pretty early, but this time I decided to go climbing after class, so I got back later, and when I got to the kitchen there were already 3 people waiting to cook their meals. Instead of heading back to my room I sat down at the table to wait, browsing reddit or something. Across from me were a guy and a girl, talking about TV shows. At some point I joined the conversation somehow, we hit it up really fast. This guy and I ended up eating together almost every night for a while. Point one day there we saw a flyer for a get together in our building, so that people living here could get to meet each other. I wasn't going to go at first, but he was, like we could drop by to have a look. So we went, go there, we met this girl, let's call her Lisa, who told us she usually ate with a group of friends in the kitchen downstairs, and that we could join them, if we wanted to point so we went. I met the whole group, including her boyfriend, who I'll refer to as Michael. I quickly became part of the group, Michael became my best friend, and the others are some of the most important people in my life. Point last year I met Michael's sister, we hit it off instantly. Now, a year later we've been dating for a few months and I feel happier than I've ever been, especially after these last few years which were really difficult for me. Point sometimes I can't help 
but think about how things would have turned out if I went straight home, as usual, that day. So, the story of how I chose this name as my new Reddit account point started playing well after a long 4 year break and the very first day I came back I did a dungeon. Was invited by, I didn't know then, but I know now, the leader of a big guild in that specific realm, Drina Ryu, though there were other leaders, or as we called them, warlords in other realms I'm from Portugal, so joining this realm I started to play with people from all over Europe, and also South Africa. Eventually I start chatting with this woman, a Romanian one, an English teacher. She was, it's, very pretty in a girl next door kind of way. We started chatting every day, but innocent stuff. I never tried to flirt with her, and she had a boyfriend. So even though I started to get some feelings, I never did anything. Not to mention all the distance between us. Portugal and Romania are on opposite sides of Europe. Western vs Eastern Europe. She once dropped a hint that she had a big crush on someone. Duh. It was me, OFC, but I was not sure, so I told her, in a very non-romantic way, something to the likes of, hey. You mentioned you had a big crush on someone on the guild. Well, I have one too. I have a big crush on you, but I know you have a boyfriend so, if I came out of line I'm sorry. If you never want to chat with me again I understand. I can't control my feelings, but I never stepped out of line, and I respect that you are in a relationship so, if you want to close this chat and never speak to me again I completely understand she admitted it was me she was talking about. We made plans to meet in Spain, where she would go on vacation with a lady friend, they had family in Spain, so, like a month later, she tells me her boyfriend got her an engagement ring, and that she didn't answer yes or no, she said she needed time, and she told me she didn't want to lose me. I told her I'd wait for her to figure it out, and I'd respect her decision, but she had to tell me what she chose, when she had the answer, she promised I would be the first to know point, so we keep chatting for months, making plans to meet point, until mutual friend tells me she got engaged. I pretended I didn't know a thing about it, and he sent me photos of her, with the ring on her finger, being happy, and it broke my heart point I was ready if she wanted to be with him, but I kind of expected her to tell me, not know from friends, weeks after the fact she told me it was just so people stop asking her if she's engaged or when she would get married, so she sent that to everyone in the guild, I checked, everyone knew, but me, but she still acted like she wanted me and she swore. She didn't tell him yes or no point, so she decided to move in with him. She was looking for a house for herself in the city near the schools she teaches, but it was too expensive for her, and she moved in with him. OFC I didn't like the idea, so one time I got angry at her, she got angry at me, and I blocked her, because she was toying with me, never spoke to her again, but I know that she did in fact say no to the marriage, and moved in with her lady friend now point so yeah. Me returning to well possibly broken engagement, possibly, the most rational explanation is, I had nothing to do with it, and she was just playing with me. Guess I'll never know. I had just graduated high school, and started dating a girl I had known my whole life, but we got accepted to different universities about a 5 hour drive apart. To my 19 year old self, these drives every weekend were debilitating, when all of my friends at my school were finally free from home and were doing stuff there every weekend. In the end I didn't care, because I loved her. Towards the end of the semester I was becoming very depressed with school, feeling lonely and homesick, and would have these fantasies of being a musician, something I always did, since I was kid, but I was studying chemistry in uni. I lived in a two-bedroom dorm with a friend from high school, and one day he was leaving to get his car worked on, and it happened to be the one day I didn't have loads of homework or a lab. So I got really high, and somehow found myself watching Led Zeppelin performing Stairway to Heaven Live circa 76 or so. I was so entranced by the song, it was like a life I had forgotten about was calling me back. Then one line in the song changed my entire life yes, there are two paths you can go by but in the long run there's still time to change the road you're on I immediately started tearing up and reminding myself I can change my life. I dropped out of school after only being in for one semester, moved back home, became a musician, 
disappointed a lot of family members, worked at a music store for two years, eventually met some cool people, joined their band, moved into a very dirty cheap roach infested home together for a year, people couch surfed with us all the time, we toured around, recorded a record, and also went to get my associate's degree at the same time at a local community college. I eventually got burnout and decided to go back to uni once I got my associates and I did and eventually broke up with the band. I'm now about to finish my bachelor's in EE and move on, but it's been hard seeing all my friends be done with school and feeling like the old kid. The band members eventually broke up, one has a kid now, one started a pop band and another is trying to keep the band going with all new members. I'll never regret those years of my life though. I had some of the most amazing experiences and met so many awesome people, all because of that one lyric pushing me to do it. Oh and me and that girl from high school are still together. Somehow she's stuck with me through all my bullshit in these 5 years. The thread has probably reached critical mass now and this reply will get lost in the ether, but my YouTube viewing habits have suppressed near suicidal depression and given me a new outlook on life. Point I've suffered with depression for a good majority of my life, which reached a peak in 2018. I scared myself into therapy, but I'd still have peaks and troughs. To pass the time in the evenings, I'll often watch extended critiques of media, think Bomberg Eyes Dark Souls 2 video on YouTube, eventually spanning into media I haven't watched such as Avatar and Steven Universe. This then presumably led to a recommendation for a remix of other friends from the Steven Universe movie by an artist named Myatris fast forward several months and in the peaks of a depressive episode I stumble across an original song by the same artist recommended on YouTube, entirely in Russian. It's a language I'd been interested in learning for the longest time but never had the push to do so. Something clicked in my brain that evening though and I said fuck it, I need to get out of this rut, I'm learning Russian. And so I did. Every day I'm committing an hour of my time to learning Russian, whether that's during my lunch break or in the evenings it's still early days, two months of consistent learning, but the more I learn the language the more I become enthralled by it. I'd previously viewed any money earned beyond the means to live to be pointless, simply accruing in my account. In 2018 I remember telling a friend that I had money but nothing I truly wanted to spend it on. I'm now planning on visiting Moscow later this year. In 28 years and countless other holidays with family and friends. This is the first one I feel truly excited to go on and will be my first holiday alone. It's possible this is just an extended emotional high but I'm riding the wave out all the same point it's strange to reflect on it all and follow the obscure chain of events that got me to this point but I'm glad it happened point tldr stumbled into the weird side of YouTube found the drive to learn Russian and discovered something to be passionate about slash put my spare money towards single handedly suppressing my near suicidal depression started bad but ended good maybe not so much a butterfly effect but a second chance point early 90s in grade 9 junior high in canada i has a huge crush on a girl who we shall call cat we were close friends and did a work experience class together at a local elementary school which was a short walk from our junior high where we read books to kate to kids one day she had to stay late so I went and bought a rose, walked back to the school, met her halfway, and asked her out. She politely refused because she wanted to stay friends, and she was part of the cool kids who didn't hang out with nerds like me. She did kiss my cheek and hold my hand all the way back. End of year dance comes around, and I had promised her I would have a dance with her to save the best for last by Vanessa Williams. We kept looking at each other at the dance from our different social cliques. Close to the end of the dance, my parents came to take me home, since we were moving the next day to another part of the city. No song point the next day, I'm at the new house, waiting for the phone, to be connected and feeling sad. Once connected, about an hour later, my friend calls to ask where I went, because after what we were told, was the last song, the DJ played the Vanessa Williams song and Cat came looking for me. I was devastated point flash forward 3 years to grade 12. Cat had moved on to another social group and we didn't see each other as much, even though we were in the same school. She began dating someone new, but we remained friends for the rare classes we had together. 
I met a new girl, Anne, who was very attracted to me, despite being in a relationship already, we just clicked. After she had broken up with her boyfriend, I took too long to ask Anne out, and she got back with him. They broke up again shortly before graduation, but Anne wanted to ghost a jet to grad with her girlfriends. I had rented a limo, and went stag with my male friends. At the grad dance, I planned to dance to a slower BNL song with Anne and perhaps make my move. We had been teasing each other for weeks. During a slower part of the dance night, awards, or silly games or something, me and my friends took the limo for a ride downtown for about 30 minutes and then went back to the dance. I found Anne's friends and they told me she had requested our BNL song and had gone looking for me. After she discovered I had left in the limo, she just went home point I was devastated again. I remember sitting at a table, head in hands, crying, yes damn it, I cried, at two missed opportunities I suddenly heard a familiar song, and then two high heeled shoes appeared before me. I looked up, and saw Kat standing there, smiling, holding out her hand, save the best for last by Vanessa Williams playing in the background. I think this is three years too late, we enjoyed our slow dance together, under the watchful eye of her boyfriend, and I will always remember that chain of events. Losing my virginity ended with me on TV point I'm 16, and haven't had sex yet. A friend of a friend wants to be my girlfriend and we start hanging out. Just kissing, touching. She lived a couple of towns away, so I'd be like one slash week, but she could drive her parents car so cool. So one weekend we're down in her basement on a bed and the kissing gets heavy. We get our pants down, and there's a lot of touching. I'm going crazy, and think this might be the time. So I poke myself around, and she's moaning, and really receptive. So I go for it point the exact second the head goes I erupt completely. It didn't take one pump or even one second. Completely ashamed and hoping she hasn't noticed, looking back, she definitely noticed, I dismount and say, we shouldn't do this, so that ends. She brings me home, we kiss, it's all good. Maybe three weeks later she calls me, and in a half shaken half angry voice tells me she tested herself twice, and she's pregnant point well I told her I'd back her up with whatever she wants to do, but I think neither of us are in any kind of position to have a kid, and I'll figure out a way to pay for it, if she has an abortion point I was in a group home at the time and a staff member's wife was high up in the local planned parenthood. I lay my problem on him, and he says just go, and make an appointment, and get it done, you can make a payment plan of anything, even a dollar a month. So jobless and in high school I make an appointment, and feel really good about myself for being a stand up guy, and taking care of this. Everything is all set on me, and my girlfriend are happy now point so about a week before the appointment she starts getting horrible morning sickness at her school, a different one than mine. She breaks down in front of the school nurse, crying and telling all, and the school nurse calls her mom who gets the whole story point a week is not good enough for her mom who sets an appointment three days later. I call, I wait outside the clinic. They won't let me talk to her. The deed is done, and I call many times in the following week to no avail, no cell phones back then. Finally after a week they let me through to her on the phone. She tells me the psychologist she's now seeing doesn't think it's a good idea for us to stay together. So that sucks. But she also tells me I owe her $360 because I said I'd pay. This way a lot of money in 1994. I of course agree and that's that point well getting a job wasn't going to work from the group home. I start saving whatever I can but this is going to be a long time point about 3 months later I hear that she's with a straight edge guy who runs the shows at the teen punk rock center, Ebb, and he's threatening to kick my, as if I don't pay her, well I don't have the money, and I'm not scared of him, he's my agent skinny, but his friends are these other hardcore straight edge dudes. So there's a promenade in this city where all the teenagers hang out after school. I start making sure I walk around with my tall friends when I'm there. Sure enough, after a couple of weeks I see him round the corner with his big buddies waving a fist and screaming, motherfucker, immediately, it's apparent the other parties are going to let this be a clean, one on one fight. I toss my backpack on the ground and brace for this punch. Sure enough he unwisely swings with the same fist he's been threatening. I'm not one to brag, but I just begin decimating him. 
he's bloody in the face, gets banged up against the window of a Ben and & Jerry's, and then down against the metal feet of a park bench on the bricks. He got a couple of ground punches with me on top of him. I mean, I was attacked point one of his guys pulls me off him and holds my arms behind my back. My friend does the same to him. However I'm calm and he's screaming, let me at him, let me at him. My friend decides, if he wants more I guess he can have, and lets him go. His friend hangs on a good deal longer. Long enough to put me in a headlock. Completely unaware, it's at this moment a reporter has finished setting up his camera, and begins filming point, so I'm in a completely unfair headlock. A fleeting sense of panic hits and I feel something poking into my cheek. I instinctively aim toward it, and bite with all my mandibular force. A he scream and gets punched a couple more times, bent over a knee in the collarbone, and pushed against a tree. His guy grabs me again, threatens me and the fight is over come to find out I bit his nipple ring completely out point the next day I'm famous. You were on the news last night. My friend's mom even taped it, and he gave me a copy point for weeks they played it again and again, whenever they wanted to complain about teenagers. Teen violence is on the rise, when the juveniles graduate from the juvenile system point he had to call the station, to get them to stop playing it point TLDR I humiliatingly impregnated a girl the first time I had sex which led to a fight, where I bit a guy's nipple ring out, and it played over and over on local news for a few hundred thousand people. I decided to date a good girl for once. She went to church, had a nice family etc. We date for 3 years, buy a house together, and things are going nicely. I get a new job in hopes to provide more. My training was 6 hours away, Monday through Friday, and come home for weekends. I came home after the second week and she decided to invite two of her girlfriends over. So I'm about 3 quarters of a case of beer in, and they decided to play truth or dare. I should've known. However I was intoxicated. My girlfriend dares me to grab her friend by the tit. I declined what the fuck are you crazy hell no. She persisted and got her friends in on it. Eventually I gave in. This was truth or dare, but apparently I wasn't allowed truths. I was shamed after that one. The next day she dares me to make out with the same chick. I did the same hell no. I walked out the house completely mind faked. Called my brother and explained what was going on and that I was freaking out man. He initially tells me to go have a foursome, and after a while tells me he thinks some weird sheets going on, and I better not do anything. So I go back in the house, and go into the living room. No one's there? My girlfriend calls my name and I walk into our bedroom, where three completely naked girls are sitting on my bed laughing point I don't know what the fuck was wrong with me, but I said you two get the fuck out. They left and on the following Monday morning, when I got to my hotel in Marion, Illinois I was greeted with a phone call saying you need to get out of my house. I've fallen in love with another man. She got the house that I spent all of my savings on, burned my clothes, and took my faking dog man. She cold kept it all and it would've been fine, but she took my faking dog. Okay this one isn't such a huge deal or anything like that, but it's definitely a butterfly effect I think. When I was a senior in high school, I was in an earth science class. I was a fairly social person, and wanted to make friends in that class. I was quick to make friends with the girl sitting next to me, but I noticed that the two boys sitting at our table were really really quiet. I decided to be nice, and try to become friends with them. Turns out one was a freshman and the other was a sophomore. Well, over time, I was kind of being overly nice to them, just because I wanted them to know they had a friend and whatnot. My goal was for them to be comfortable talking to me, and trying to have a little fun in that class. Well, they both ended up developing crushes on me, because they misunderstood me being nice, at least I think that's why. The sophomore, who was named Hunter, became really creepy, and would follow me around everywhere. He would even follow me to some of my classes, which always ended with him being late to his own classes. His friends would always whistle and call at us in the hallways and that made me unbearably uncomfortable. He would always do his absolute darn desk to always be with me. He was in another one of my classes, and convinced that teacher to change the seating chart so that he could sit next to me. Over time, things just really really escalated. He even got me a Christmas gift. 
The other one, Sam, who was a freshman, didn't develop his crush until like four months into the year. He was for sure the quieter of the two, but eventually became a talking machine. I was really proud of him until he started talking a little bit too much. Like I'm talking him being up in my face speaking at like a million miles per hour about farches and other things freshman boys like to talk about. A lot of the things he talked about Loki made me uncomfortable just because it was kind of gross. He was definitely not afraid of being honest. It was a harmless crush, though. He mainly just stuck to my side a lot like Hunter, but was respectful and didn't seek me out outside of that class like Hunter did. Every time I'd talk to somebody else, which was a lot, Sam would come in and interrupt the conversation so he could talk to me. Sometimes if he didn't have things to say he'd interrupt my conversations by showing me really old meme compilation videos on YouTube. They were harmless crushes for the most part. Hunter went a bit too far at one point about intruding my personal space, so I had to talk to my teacher about the situation. But when I think butterfly effect this usually pops up in my head. They were so quiet on that first day, and then just over the course of a few months they went crazy town and everybody knew about them liking me. People would often point it out, and I'd be like yeah, I know, sighed. Story, there was another boy in that class who had a crush on me, and we ended up going out once, because we were such good friends. He was seriously awesome and the date was fun. Except his was on that date, when I realized that he was really controlling, and has to have everything his way, and would get mad at me if I wanted to do something else. He also didn't take me home when he was supposed to, so that was a red flag. Felt bad for the guy, because he didn't seem at all that way during class and NGL I kinda liked him a little bit. He would buy me muffins all the time and we usually worked together in class. He would come to my other classes sometimes, and it was really fun. But then the date, and yeah I dodged a bullet. Here's my story, I toured a local college's engineering program with my mom, and felt my anxiety gradually go up when they started discussing trigonometry, which I was horrible at. Mom, dad, and I decided to talk about the tour over dinner at a local restaurant and we all agreed that it wouldn't be a good fit, so I decided to check out a Lafayette guitar building tech school across the state. I get accepted, and move point I dropped out in the first month due to mental illness and money problems. After I gathered my marbles, I applied to work in a cabinet shop, since I still loved woodworking. I got hurt on the job, so I found another job with some semblance of benefits. Got hurt there too, so I decided to use the little drafting experience I have and shift careers. I'm actually making great money in what I'm doing now, and I'm really happy with it. Here's my brother's story. My brother was in his senior year of college studying physics and working at a small college town bar around early spring. While working, he's talking with a regular about what he should do after college. Local says this medical program company one state over is hiring. And it sounds like you like computers. My brother writes it down and applies online later on. He gets a call for an interview. Lands job. Graduates. Moves there with his then girlfriend. She lands a job for the legislative branch of that state. Get engaged about a year later. They're both bringing in massive amounts of money and doing fantastic in their careers. All because some dude told my brother about some medical tech company. To start off sorry if there are any mistakes or do not think it fits here I am really tired. I don't think I really set this off but here it goes. It's 2012 and my mom was working the morning shift. It was sunny and warm that day, but there were still patches of black ice on the road. She hit the black ice on a turn and rolls until the vehicle hit a tree. Surprisingly she did not have a scratch on her. I was 12 at the time, and came inside at the very moment my dad's phone started ringing. He was out sleeping hard, and I usually never answer a random number call especially on his phone. For some reason I decided to answer it, and it turns out it was my mom on a police officer's phone. She was refusing to go to the hospital because she said she was fine and didn't think we could afford it. My dad went to get her and convinced her to go to the hospital to get scans to make sure she did not fracture her neck. No fractures to be seen, but random tiny spots on her lungs. They say it's probably nothing but decided to look further into it. Turns out it's stage 4 melanoma cancer, super deadly, they gave her 7 months maximum. 
She decided for all of her kids, six kids, she will do anything and everything possible to last as long as she can. Luckily they caught it early enough to start chemotherapy. She has done every option of chemo out there, is missing half her lungs, has no spleen, and many other surgery scars, but she is still trying her best to beat it even with no more chemo options and they gave her 7 days a week before Christmas, but is still here today and refuses to let any doctor tell her how long she has left. Sometimes I think what would have happened if she didn't get in that car accident? Or what if I didn't pick up the phone and the officer gave her a ride back to my parents place and she didn't get medical treatment. Life can be crazy. Not quite as drastic as a lot of these, but I remember sitting back on the day thinking about where it all went wrong point I walked my neighbor's dog for them, and on this day I had planned to pick him up and drive to a nearby open land area. Well, he didn't want to get in the car himself. Instead of putting the leash on him and making him, I said fuck it, and we went into the nearby woods instead, to walk into a state park about 15 minutes away on foot, we live in the middle of nowhere, so lots of places to hike, on our return he starts running off after a fox, instead of chasing him, and putting him on leash, I'll let him. He does this often and always returns and we were literally back on his property, which is quite large. However, when he returns he's covered in the most god-awful mush you could possibly imagine. I mean, I could smell this putrid stank from Satan's asshole 10 feet away. I don't even know what to do with him. His owners are out, it's 35 degrees outside, and I can't find a hose anywhere. Meanwhile, we passed the lawn guys who were blowing leaves for the last time before winter. This was late fall. I walk him to my house, another 5 to 10 minutes away, and get my hose to spray him down. Luckily it worked despite the cold, and he's a cold weather dog who loves water, so he's in his smelly, wet glory at this point point take him back to his house, and get him inside for a bath, that took a half hour, and despite getting him clean he still smelled horrid, but not much more I could do point later I realize it's very possible one of the lawn guys took a sheet in the woods, they are there for hours with no access to a bathroom since my neighbors were out, and that's likely what the dog rolled in. I had gone to look for what it was, and found it right next to a tree, and while it was all mushed in the leaves from him rolling, so it was hard to tell, it was definitely in a position a human world views point so, because I didn't force the dog into the car, when I wanted to, I wound up spending about one and one half hours cleaning human sheet off of him. What a day. Luckily I laugh about it now, but I nearly threw up from that stench a bunch of times during the fiasco. Bringing a Lego set to school 15 years ago led me to sniffing lines of sherbet then a job interview with the police force. Not bad. But just a lot of craziness I brought a Lego Star Wars set to school in year 2, a new student started that same day, and brought that same Lego set we became friends because of this. We decided that every day for about 4 years we would bring Lego to school, his parents sent him to a different school, I went to a different school my new teacher. At my new school, now in grade 7, turned out to also be a substitute teacher at my old friend's new school. My new teacher knows the student I was asking about at her other school she talks to him he talks to his parents his parents give him a note with their contact, details to give to the teacher. To bring to me I give that note to my parents my parents organize a meet up with between all of us all reunited slash 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 my parents ask me which high school I want to go to. They give me a choice between two. I choose one that sounds cool before the first day of high. School starts. I stay over at my old friends. How's to play Skyrim? Only recently released, we decide to celebrate starting high school by sniffing lines of sherbet. We thought we were cool. The next day I start my first day of high school in class I start having a sneezing attack and the leftover sherbet in my nose starts burning. Teacher sends me to the nurse's office where I meet her another student waiting to be seen by the nurse he thinks it's funny how I have sherbet in my nose and we become friends he introduces me to his friend in the school band the band friend introduces me to his girlfriend the girlfriend introduces me to her best friend now in grade 10. The best friend and I start dating the kid I met in the nurse's office starts seeing the girl I'm dating we break up I like the band friend's girlfriend the band friend and his girlfriend break up. I start dating the band friend's ex I meet her parents the parents say I would be a good scientist. When I'm older I start doing all of the science subjects at school, was previously doing arts and English subjects, 
the girl and I break up I wasn't doing any schoolwork got a bad final result didn't get into the university I wanted. Chose a course I didn't want to do, at a university I didn't want to be at met a girl studying the same course as me a few months later she introduces me to her friend at a party her friend and I start dating. A few weeks later I meet her family, one of her family members who was in the air force tells me I should consider joining the military, I do consider I apply, pass the initial tests military tells me that I would be better suited to the police force and did not recommend I proceed further with my military recruitment process I have now been with my girlfriend for 3. Yes, we have a puppy and I go in for my police interview in a week's time point crazy stuff. I got a mild headache in year 9, when I was about 14 I think. Nothing bad, just kind of annoying. However, it never went away, and over the course of the next few months kept on getting worse and worse point I went to dozens of doctor's appointments and examinations, looking for both a physiological or psychological reason for the pain it was in. Nobody could find a reason, even now I don't know, and after so many different tablets I lost count it was decided they weren't working, and I just stayed on the one I was presently prescribed, since they are hard to come off of. That was probably 2 or 3 years ago. Anyway, I started missing lessons or entire days of school, light, and noise both made it worse, and in the months leading up, until I completely dropped out I came into school earlier than everyone else, and collected some work from teachers, then went to the library to complete it all, and went home halfway through the day. Unfortunately, the library was also where all of the special needs kids were dumped, so it was never quite like it should been point once I entirely stopped going to school, I spent a while teaching myself the GCSE courses for all of the subjects I'd been taking, from textbooks I bought and online resources. It was going well, but since we couldn't afford proper tutors and I legally had to have some sort of education, since apparently me homeschooling myself didn't count. After a long time battling with the local council I got a place in a classroom of 8 people like me who couldn't attend proper secondary school which was inside one of the nearby colleges in its own small wing. I thought it would be great and I wouldn't completely fail everything and ruin all of my childhood dreams I had. I was wrong point before even getting to that place I took the back quote bus. It can be called a bus since it was a van with seats bolted into the back. My seat, which was in the front, wasn't even a chair. Where the normal car seat should have been, there was a crate tied to the wall with bungee cord and a cushion on top. The doors didn't shut properly and rattled constantly, and one time as it pulled up at the college to pick us up one of the wheel rims literally fell off. The driver just used a zip tire to put it back on point needless to say, before even getting to my classes I was in so much pain I could hardly see straight. Now on to the lessons, I had failed to consider that each of the other kids had dropped out of school at different times, and none of them had continued to teach themselves. Most of them idiots, and in the space of a year we had to do a crash course through 5 years of work, since at least one person hadn't done each topic point I hated it even more than I did normal school, and dropped out of that place as well 2 months before the GCSE exams were to start. It was a shame, since there was one person there who I actually did really like. I can honestly say she was the first person ever to actually be able to read me, and within a few weeks, had picked up my unique mannerisms that I use, since I struggle to communicate. Even my parents haven't caught onto a single one after me doing them my whole life. I never saw her again, and I do sometimes regret leaving that place behind, just because it was nice to have a friend for one's point anyway, after dropping out for the second time luckily the man who ran the special class managed to talk to the education board or something, because I wasn't required to keep doing any more schooling. And when exams came around an invigilator came to my home for them instead of me going to an exam center like the other 7 kids from the class, did point after that, I just laid around for a few months doing nothing but work out and play video games without leaving the house, until college started, and I didn't even try to attend. Through the unit I was in I was able to get a place in an online college, and did my A levels through there, although lessons over a computer with teachers that didn't care about their shitty jobs or me was boring and tedious. I didn't get anywhere near the grades I'd wanted, and were predicted to get, all in every subject, for either A level or GCSE. I couldn't really bring myself to care. 
and that's how one small headache ruined my life before it even had a chance to begin. I've still got them, and they are still horrendously painful. My tolerance for pain has increased significantly over the years. I can tear off my own fingernails without flinching, so that would be a cool party trick if I had anybody to party with, although having distractions helps a lot. It's why I don't like having nothing to do, which is often mistaken for ADHD when in reality I just don't want to be left to my own thoughts and the pain to come creeping in point up. I've never actually typed this out before or said it to anyone that was strangely therapeutic. I've had a few, but this one comes to mind in particular in college I started dating someone I was good friends with. Things were great for a while in every sense of the word. One day she gets an A on a super difficult exam and throws a party, and I went over a bit late after working all day. I get there, and we have fun socializing with everyone, and about 30 minutes after that her neighbors show up and convince us to go drive to a bar about two blocks down the street. I'm exhausted and say no to driving, and asked her to point unfortunately I didn't realize how sheet housed she was, and she runs the first stop sign, absolutely demolishes a dude on a bike. I yell at her to stop, and thank god one of the passengers in the back was a firefighter, because he sobered up real quick and helped the injured guy. He stopped him from trying to stand and paralyzing himself. I saw the dude's leg snap like a broken chicken drumstick point cops show up as does an ambulance. She went to jail for the night. Dude recovered eventually and got like a 200k settlement from my knowledge, so I guess it worked out for him. She gets out and became like super unhinged just doing crazy things. Eventually it culminated in her dressing up for a frat party putting twigs and sticks in her hair and ending the night at our weed dealer's house talking nonsense in the street, no drugs involved. Then I called the cops to Baker act her and her parents basically picked her up and brought her home and attempt to put her life back together all this because I was too tired to drive. Got punched in the face at work, got fired as a result. Met someone as a result from that job ending. Caught feelings for them. Moved in with them. Turned out they had no feelings for me and got off on mental abuse. The move and the rent was more. Put a strain on work and class. Lost job and dropped class. Ended up dipping into my 401k to try and make ends meet. They didn't. After losing another job from a result of the worst mental state I've ever been in, at least up to that point, got worse later, I enlisted in the army for a combat MOs and to be airborne, only telling a couple of family members and disappeared. Got hurt physically pretty bad. Got accused of having child born, on my birthday, yay mental state. They learned I like dad is not daughters. I pushed back, once the false accusation happened. Got cleared of it, wrote a ton of medical claims and got out. The Bido was found and jailed. My life got fixed for the most part. I'm financially stable, but still struggling with intimacy issues so. Getting punched in the face fixed my life on a financial aspect, but not through a lawsuit. However it also set forth my mental decline to the point where I was deemed passively suicidal. As in, I really wish a truck would hit me, but because I know my passing will cause grief for others, I will always dreadfully avoid the truck the best I can, while hoping I fail and it hits me anyways. Saved me from dealing with being on suicide watch in the army at least point the best and worst thing to ever happen to me in life was getting punched in the face, and it's really depressing. Randomly went to an iPoint course, it was a scam, but I was 16. Met a guy who knew me apparently, and a guy I knew from the youth center who were talking. Wound up suggesting guy who knew me come to the youth center point guy immediately meets girl who he'd go on to date in an unbelievably toxic relationship for a couple of years. She was an amazing person, he was a manipulative sociopath point a couple years later they separate for good, but we've spent forever fighting, and I'm never quite sure where our friendship stands again point I wind up unable to deal with people in general for a while always worried people don't want anything to do with me, and are just pretending. This leads me to just not develop my life, until things have gone far too off the rails at 25. Previously mentioned girl finds me a place to stay with someone she knows when I've been stranded in the West Australian desert with no driver's license, a month to find a place to live, and no job point at 27 I get my first job and finally begin restarting the life I just stopped living at. 
18 to 19 point back then I had sleep issues. Anxiety issues actually but nobody was looking for that then. I couldn't do school, and I'd left so many other random courses already, usually when I just wouldn't be able to sleep before daylight, and also be expected to be up at 8am. If I'd just not gone that day, my life could have gone so differently. Her personality wouldn't have gained a bitter edge to it. A dozen friendships might still exist. Hell, at least one store might still exist, or have gone out of business a year earlier. But no, I went that day and invited the nice enough seeming guy to come hang out. And in the process inadvertently gained an incredibly important friend while positioning her so she could be used as a perfect weapon to destroy my already fragile mental state. I set in motion events that had seen me finally escape my abusive family for good. Ten years later, as a direct consequence of that friendship. Late to the party, but... My best friend hooked me up with an easy university job and the result was that within 10 years I'd be a homeless alcoholic divorcee with PTSD. Point clearly a lot of steps in between point friend got me job where she was the manager. She quit two months later. The person hired to replace her was Todd. I was 19, him 24. I can look back now and see his behavior as grooming, but at the time there was just this older guy who was interested in me. We got together a few years later. He moved me to a new city to be with him within a few months. Convinced me to marry him pretty quickly after that point right around the time I agreed to marriage. I'm 25 at this point. Things get crazy. I mean legit insanity. He quit his job and expected me to just get a better job to support his lifestyle. He continued to isolate me from my friends and family to the point that if I wasn't going to my job, I wasn't allowed to leave the house. We still got married. He would hold me hostage in the house by threatening to commit suicide and actually attempting suicide. He starts questioning whether I really need to leave the house to work and if work is just an excuse to cheat on him. Verbally abusive is an understatement. He watches Westworld and starts questioning if I'm actually human. He thinks I'm a robot created to destroy him, that my mere existence in his life has condemned him to hell, a weird concept for a self-proclaimed atheist, when I was around 27 I started drinking really heavily, needed at least 5 drinks to even leave the office and face my life at home. When I was nearly 29, I knew I needed out. I got a therapist and a lawyer and started planning my escape. Christmas Eve 2018, I fled in the middle of the night. After he had broken my leg and put my head through a wall the previous day, swung a sword at my face too, got a hotel the first night. Spent the next day in the police station filling the report and having my injuries photographed. Spent several months homeless, bouncing from place to place until the divorce evicted him from the house I bought and paid for. Need super regular therapy now because the PTSD causes me regular panic attacks and night terrors. Constantly in fear that he'll find me again, even though I sold the house and moved to another town. The struggle with alcohol is daily point all because I wanted to work in a computer lab in college. Okay so I'm absolutely horrible at making a long story short, but I'll try point so around 8 years ago I was dating someone and had been with them for about 5 years. We got into an argument, so I headed out to the bar. Saw an old friend of my cousin, so I went to say hi point we talked for a while and he introduced me to a girl he was with. Turn out it was her birthday and not his girlfriend, so being the friendly drunk I bought her a few drinks. We had a great night and I made a new friend point or so I thought point fast forward a few months and the girl I was with decided to tell me she had been talking to someone since our argument and it was over. I was upset, but not for too long as this girl I met at the bar started making it obvious that she was into me. I originally wasn't that into her as anything more than a friend, but we got really close in the coming weeks. She had a 2 year old, but I didn't care she was awesome and gorgeous, and I wanted to be with her well here I'm 8 years later 2 more kids later and nothing other than my 3 amazing kids to show for it. She ended up having a ton of red flags. Well more like bonfire signal flares, 
to warn me this was a bad idea, but I was young and dumb and wanted to fix her, and now life is falling apart. Point I'm currently staying in my parents' basement at 32 years old with nothing but my clothes, a futon, and a TV, and have to walk to work 5 miles each way every day because my license got suspended due to her never working and spending all of the money from me working and not being able to pay a simple speeding ticket fine, and I get to see my kids maybe a couple days a week, because I need to walk there, when I want to see them point my daughter just turned 3 on Saturday, happy birthday baby, and I was allowed to go to the party, just to overhear her, and her cousin talking shit about me not bringing a present for her. Again I'm broke trying to recover from her, and the debt she put me in plus still buying whatever I can that my children need. I thanked her for letting me be there and quietly left after saying goodbye to the kiddos, so tldr got into an argument with my girlfriend. Went to the bar. Lose said girlfriend. End up with someone who is manipulative and abusive to me, and now I live in my parents basement at 32 years old with nothing. I was 23 I and in college. I was drinking at a bar one night and ran into a guy who I had multiple previous conversations with. He tells me about him climbing this old tower in an abandoned amusement park in town. After a couple drinks, more conversation and the bar closing down for the night, he asks if I'm up to go climb the tower that night with him. I agree. So we ride our bikes down to the abandoned amusement park, slide under the fence, walk up to the tower, which is about 200 feet tall or so. We climb into the tower and proceed to climb to the top using some ladders inside. We drink a few beers up top and decide to head down after a couple hours since it was getting to be early morning and the sun was about to rise. I go home and go to bed point I wake up late morning just before noon decide to ride my bike down to the coffee shop that acts like a main hub where all of my friends would hang out, smoke cigarettes, tell stories and heckle the frat boys. A few of my friends are hanging out on the patio and I tell them about my previous night's adventure. A couple of them were asking questions about the logistics of the tower. I tell them everything. The day goes on and everything is good, no work or school, doing the normal college kid stuff. I go to bed semi-early that night due to hangover and a late night climbing the tower. I wake up the next morning for school, but with a stop at the same coffee shop, and as I'm pulling up I notice it isn't the same antics as it usually is and everybody is crying. They proceed to tell me about our buddy, who was listening into my story, and about the logistics, had gotten drunk the previous night, and decided to go climb the tower. He climbed up to the top eagle nest area, and was drinking beers. Someone from the surrounding neighborhood, called the cops on him. The cops showed up, and ordered him to come down. On his descent something happened, and he fell to his death point I know it wasn't my fault, but I feel, like it was something I influenced without a doubt. Like what if I never mentioned it to that group of people the morning after I climbed it? Would he still be alive? Hard to say, but it's weird having something you said influence someone to do something that would lead to their death. I'm 32 so it's been about 10 years since, and I think about it a few times a year I don't know if this is necessarily a butterfly effect to the fullest, but my conversation influenced him to climb the tower which lead to his death. I need to remind myself that my actions and conversations can have the power to change someone's life. It could be for the better as well, but this time in specific it was definitely not for the better the city decided to tear down the tower a couple weeks later due to his death. It was an amusement park that hadn't been operational for a couple decades or IP. Well I don't even know where it really started. But in 2015 my depression hit hard, I just finished school, and had a job which I lost several months later. As some of you may know, being depressed as fuck, and having to find a new job are not the best combination, and I made the mistake of letting it slide for too long, which brings us to a night, where I was out with friends, despite not wanting to in the first place. But then I thought fuck it, better than being miserable at home. We got drunk and high and later I went home around 3am. I was pretty faked up, but wanted to smoke a J before bed, which I had to do outside due to living with my parents who think weed is like heroin point, if I only knew before. The cops busted me, and treated me like Al Capone, or as if I just killed their family. That led to being punched, knocked out and cracking my head on the street point and well, 
I have to live with the effects all my life now and feel it every single day. It left me with some sort of brain damage, I assume, but no doc was able to confirm it yet. Not intellectually, but in terms of my body functions. I developed strabismus, not directly but with one to two days delay after the incident and some sort of hyperhidrosis. And of course, this made me spiral even deeper into my depression than ever before point and that lead to a lot of more faked up sheet, but I don't want to write a book right now point the thing is, there are so much variables, and if I had only changed one, I wouldn't have get busted, and thus would be healthy now. And it's faked up. There's not a single day where I don't think about it point this life is certainly some crazy sheet and the butterfly effect is a beach. Didn't want to go home for Thanksgiving because I just started my new job and didn't want to take off any days early on point eventually decided to go point no blizzard cancels my return flight at a connecting airport each day for two days as I live off airport food point third day was a high probability of getting cancelled as well point at this point I was worried about missing too many days of work. I said fuck it, I'll fly into a neighboring city 3 hours away and get a rental car I fly in and match with a girl on tinder. Ok cool, whatever might get a date out of this, maybe get laid, when I'm returning the rental car point I drive the rental car back home through a blizzard, hit a block of ice that rips off the front bumper of the car. The night gets shittier, when I arrived home I tried to get the car I own out of the airport parking space, by myself, dumb idea, managed to jog a mile back and forth parking my rental car, and getting my own car in a safe neighborhood between my house and the airport point couldn't see how high the snow drift was, and my rental car fall into a ditch in this neighborhood point it's 3am work starts at 6. I haven't showered, since living in the airport for two and half days. I leave the rental car in the ditch and drive back home to get ready for work point after work. I got said rental car out of ditch and drove back to city to return it. Girl from Tinder hits me up while I'm an hour away and says she wants to hang out point my business and I said fuck it we are staying in neighboring city tonight take girl out on date in my rental car. We go to a local bar downtown. Literally one of the best dates of my life. She tells me she wants to go back to her place. I gladly oblige point as we are driving back I get pulled over by the cops. They said they pulled me over for missing a front bumper on my car. Then they ask what I was doing tonight and I told them I was on a date. Then they ask my date for her ID as well point cop comes back asks me to step out of the vehicle. I turn off the car and put my keys in my pocket. Cop body tackles me and throws me in a police vehicle because I put my keys in my pocket. Other cop does the same to my date cop then proceeds to tell me I'm under arrest for trying to bang a prostitute, literally no proof of that statement. He said I think you are driving a stolen vehicle, your driver's license is from out of state and you don't even live in this city point I tell the cop he had permission to check my phone and read my tinder conversation with her. Turns out my date ended up going to jail because she had a warrant out for her arrest. To this day I still don't know what for. Cop ends up changing his mind about me and lets me go point I drive 3 hours back home in the middle of the night just shocked. Laugh out loud point TLDR didn't want to go to Thanksgiving to see my family. Ended up deciding to go. Get stuck at the airport for 2.5 days. Fly into a neighboring city. Match with girl on Tinder. Damage my rental car. Drive rental car in ditch. Go on date with girl from Tinder. We end up getting arrested, I end up being let, go see doesn't moral of the story, don't do nice things for your family. My friend had a crush on this guy, we'll call him Mike. My friend will be called Stasi. So Stasi's Kawaka's son, Mike, was introduced by said Kawaka. We all knew the Kawaka is a cool guy, and Mike honestly seemed cool too. Stasi and Mike start hanging out a lot. They both end up separately confiding in me that they like the other. So I have myself a chat with Mike one night and basically tell him go for it, you guys both like each other. So he does, and they get together it's not long before Mike starts showing his true, sheety, colors. I can't get Stussy away, no matter what I do. Everyone, and I mean everyone in Stussy's life is doing everything short of kidnapping her to get her away from Mike. A few years in his abuse, escalated from just mental to physical. And this whole time you can see her deteriorating. She drinks more, 
she gains a ton of weight. She is the type of girl who gains weight when she's miserable. So whenever she does, you know something's up. And after one especially bad night between her and Mike, she attempts suicide. If I hadn't been there, who knows if she would have survived. I was staying with her at the time. I was almost asleep when she stumbles into my room. It wasn't unusual for her to stumble like that, but something just didn't seem right. Some sort of instinct kicked in, and I started shaking her cause I could hardly get a response. I shouted are you okay? She I shook her a little more and said Stacy. Stacy, Did you take pills? I got her to nod yes. Oh no. I call 9, double 1, and they come and take her away. She lived. But the nurse said she almost died. I went to the hospital to see her, but her mom wouldn't let me in. At the time I was angry, but looking back, I understand why she did that. I was told later that Stussy had been in some kind of psychosis. She didn't remember her mom, who she was, where she was, or why, and was reportedly very aggressive in her state of confusion. And I think her mom didn't want me to have to see her like that. I think I could have handled it but maybe not. Good news is she did end up finally leaving Mike. Nowadays we look at the slow of Mike's ever increasing mug shots. Sometime after the breakup, I guess he somehow lost everything he had and was living out of a van and then decided he might as well be a full time criminal I guess. The guy was faking nuts and thank our lucky stars that Stussy was able to live through it and break a waypoint even though everything worked out okay. Even though I was basically the one who saved her life. Even though our friendship lived through all of it, I still feel so incredibly guilty for getting them together I know she has issues with her dad and men in general, so logically, she probably would have found a toxic man on her own. It wouldn't have been the first time. But even knowing every other factor that could possibly lead her to put up with an abusive as whole, the question still plagues me, what if I hadn't encouraged Mike? Doubt this will be seen after so many other posts. But here goes I used to work at a fast food travel plaza on third shift. I was the only worker, so this includes taking the order, making the food passing it out and repeat. This was on the toll road, so it wasn't uncommon to get busloads of about 30 to 40 people at a time. The janitor at the time was supposed to help me with this many people. So I'm at the register waiting around when I see three buses pull up. I frantically search for the janitor Todd. He's nowhere to be found. My co-worker at the other end of the plaza manning the gift shop hasn't seen him either. So I say fuck it. I'll handle it myself. Point I'll let my lobby of at least 60 to 70 people know my situation. I'm alone. So I'll take three orders make the food and continue. They were all very patient and understanding. Thankfully. I get most of them served before the buses have to leave to continue their trip point my manager comes in the morning and asks me how things went and I tell her about Todd's disappearance and the whole deal with the buses. So we check the security cameras and watch him get in his car and leave without clocking out. They check further back and this is something he's been doing regularly for some time point so they fire him and I think this is the last I will ever hear about Todd. A few years later I'm working in a factory job talking to a co-worker about this story and he shows me a picture of this guy Todd. I couldn't recognize him because he had to have surgery on his face point turns out. After he fired he went to a factory where they made wooden braces for the roofs of houses. He was operating a press machine that would smash pieces together to fit them. The machine malfunctioned and shot a large piece of wood through his face point and that's the story of how my butterfly effect nearly killed someone. He did get a nice settlement from the accident. Last I knew he was retired. A friend of mine asked me to join him and some other friends for karaoke and I obliged. Ended up talking all night, well in between songs, with a guy and figured that was that. A couple weeks later he hit me up on Facebook and invited me to a party. I don't like parties and I get really uncomfortable around large groups of people, especially when I don't know any of them. So I tried to be cute in turning him down by saying I couldn't find a particular shirt I wanted to wear, but if it turned up I'd go. Hadn't seen the shirt in weeks, but guess what showed itself. Anyway I went to the party, met a bunch of new people, ended up hooking up with the guy, and was in a relationship with him for a year. It was the worst relationship I've ever been in. Emotionally abusive, gaslighting to oblivion. 
he was cheating on me the entire time, and after a while wasn't even hiding it anymore, while emotionally beating me down, so I wouldn't leave. That was nearly a decade ago, and I haven't been in a relationship since. Dated a couple of people, and am madly in love with one, but it'll never happen, but haven't had a proper boyfriend since him. I curse the day I went to that karaoke bar. It was the worst decision I've ever made. I don't know if I'll ever fully recover from this 1.0 a couple years ago I went to a small gathering at the home the initial party was hosted, and he was there. We actually had a good conversation, so that was good. A few years prior to that he had apologized for everything he did and told me that I didn't do anything to deserve any of it, which was nice, but the damage was done. I don't know if I'll ever be in a relationship again. I was walking down the street putting my birthday invites into my friend's mailboxes. It was super hot out, and I was a child at the time so, when I had to go several blocks for one last invite I was lazily complaining. In my driveway I saw my dad and stepmom getting in their truck to head to the store. I asked them to drive me to my friends and they did. For context, they had a red truck, to seater with hard back. We were sutteral and this was before seatbelt laws so, if there were more than two people going out then someone would just sit in the truck bed, no seats or anything. They gave me a ride to my friend's house, and, after I gave her my invite, she wanted me to stay and play. I was hot and tired so I didn't want to, but my stepmom insisted I stayed there with my friend and they'd pick me up later. As I played, my stepmom drove herself and my dad to a store a few blocks away. As they turned at the light another truck from Napa Auto sped through the red light and slammed right into the driver's side of their truck. Killed my stepmom and nearly killing my dad. Wrong place, wrong time. That's not where the nightmare ends, though. My step siblings saw me leave with them, but thought I was going with them to the store, they didn't hear me ask about my friend's house. So when the police contacted them, and they find out their mom is dead, and dad isn't expected to make it, they ask about me. This freaks out the responders, because there was only two people in the truck. No children in the back, which is great, because if I was back there I'd have definitely died. Now no one knows where I'm so I'm missing. My step siblings were trying to find out where I was and called friends to help search for me. Long story short after my dad and stepmom failed to pick me up hours later I walked home by myself. Then my step siblings came back after having previously checked the house and found me and told me everything. Now I just think about how if I hadn't asked for a ride out of laziness that they wouldn't have been in an accident and people wouldn't have had to spend their time grieving and searching for a me. TLDR I ask for a ride which leads to parents being in the wrong place at the wrong time, a fatal car accident, and people searching for me. This might sound edgy, but being born. Once I was born, my mother needed help taking care of me, so she let a friend of hers move in with us with the agreement that the friend would take care of me. My parents started struggling with money, so mom looked for a job and got an amazing job offer. But it was out of state. But she needed the money, so she accepted it. Meanwhile, my dad was having an affair with my new caretaker, who eventually became my stepmother. Stepmother brought her kids and grandson with her. Typical Cinderella story occurs where I'm the black sheep and take all the blows, the blame, the screaming, etc. My stepsisters were pretty cruel to me and abusive as well. They were both in late 20s street that point, so they knew what they were doing. I start acting out, writing a journal for our teachers to read, that I'd rather run away into the woods and be eaten by wolves than stay in that house. No CPS. They send me to the counselor, who send me to a therapist who sent me to a psychologist. I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression. Dad, however, thought I was making things up. Until the cops showed up, because of several neighbors calling about a kid crying and adults yelling. That day was it. Dad kicked them out, but my stepmother was the love of his life. I ruined my father's marriage. Since then, he's had five failed engagements and three divorces. I resent him greatly for never noticing or believing in what was going on. He's pretty alone at this point. His parents are dead, my uncles aren't super fond of him, and my siblings despise him. He only has his current wife, she'll either die or divorce him sometime soon, and me. I pretty much blame myself for ruining my dad's life. 
realistically, I know that it isn't my fault, but my birth caused so many things to happen that hurt other people. Point TLDR. I was born, dad married my caretaker, stepmother abused me, cops were called, divorce was filed, dad's future relationships failed, tension between us, and now he's lonely and depressed. I'm not sure if this is the worst thing, but it was a big event that happened very recently. While at a state band convention, all state, I received a text from a friend on Saturday night. It is post season for basketball right now, and I'm in the pep band, which travels with the basketball teams to post season games. So the text says that our girls team lost, which means that they most likely have to play in a double elimination round that Thursday, which meant that we would be having pep band. The band director was also at the convention, so I was suspicious that she did not hear this news. I took a screenshot of my friend's message and spent an hour Reich contemplating whether I should send it to the BD or not. Eventually, I decided that I would send it. It turns out that I was the first person to have told the BD who contacted the athletic director to get us to the game. Because of how early the process was worked out, the pep band was immediately scheduled to be at the game. If she had found out on the following Monday, it cold been too late, and we might have not traveled point the following week was chaotic, with us trying to clean up our music and get all of our permission slips turned in for the game. It was clear that we were in a crunch for time. Soon enough, Thursday comes. We go to the game play and our girls win meaning they play again that saturday when we are also scheduled to travel with them it's pitch black outside as we are loading up the bus to go back home as we are on a country road meaning we are traveling at about 55 miles per hour the sound of cymbals rattling is heard throughout the bus it was a crash then a dissipating sizzle then a minute or two later the sound happened again we realized that the sound was happening on the outside of the bus, and not the inside. I'll never be able to forget that sound. An emergency stop later, we find out that one of the storage compartments was not closed all the way, being part of the percussion section. I was ordered to take stock of what we had, and what we didn't have. I was one of the last people to pack the compartment, so I was able to remember most of what was in it. Upon first inspection, I was struck by the sight of missing crash symbols and a snare drum. Not only that, but on icest crash symbols, just restrapped, and our best snare drum. There was also a tenor saxophone in there, which was inches away from falling out. This was a crazy this is not a drill moment for the band, which we had never experienced before. We were unable to recover anything that fell out, even with multiple people looking. Even if we did find anything, it would have been destroyed because of the speed of which it would have hit the road at point I couldn't help but think if I hadn't sent that text, we wouldn't have have been to that game. We wouldn't have had to transport our instruments. We wouldn't have suddenly and permanently lost some of our best and most used percussion equipment. Point TLDR. I sent a single text and then dollar sign 800 of drum stuff was vaporized. I personally feel like it's my fault our mother passed away point my mom got cancer back in 2012. She gets better and into remission. I stopped taking care of her as much because she said she was feeling better. She relapsed in 2016, a week after we found out I was pregnant with her first grandchild. She is in hospital from September to November 23. Her birthday was the 25th and she begged to be home. I was pregnant and tired so I didn't pay too much attention to how much medicine she was taking and I didn't argue with the doctors to check her back because she always said it at 2016 December 25th she wasn't able to walk and I called an ambulance. Turns out that back pain was a mass tumor that grew in those months. She gets emergency surgery and is stuck in the hospital. She hates it and always called me at 2 a.m. to bring her something to eat. I started to do it less and less because I was then 6 months pregnant and way too tired. She was getting scared of being in the hospital and asking slash begging me to stay but they wouldn't put a bed in the room and I wasn't able to sleep in a chair due to pregnancy. She began to refuse her medication and I would have to drive down to make her take it. Became a regular thing to get me to go. Soon her mentality crashed and she began forgetting things and people. Doctor asked if I could stay, but I couldn't, because I was too tired. 
Soon we had to put her in a coma cause she got open sores in her mouth and refused to eat or drink. She didn't understand what was happening. It was as if she was 3 years old. We unfortunately had to pull the plug 2 weeks later. Gave birth to my son a month after her passing and my depression spikes to the point I almost commit suicide multiple times both when I was pregnant the last month and after. My friend then gets cancer and I help pay a lot of money for his recovery because now I'm scared he will die like my mom did. So I use her life insurance she left for me to help him. Friend is better and agrees to pay me back it's been 2 years and he is still making excuses on why he can't pay back. So now I don't have my mom or the money she left for me. I end up arguing with my sister about our mom's passing. And we end up not talking for months I feel like, if I wasn't pregnant, I could have taken care of my mother better. I would have noticed the small things and I could have gotten her the doctor x-ray she needed. I feel like my pregnant was the butterfly effect. I love my son, but I always think what, if I wasn't pregnant, would she still be alive point sorry I have no TLDR. I'm late but this will probably feel cathartic so here goes. I caused my mom's addiction and sent her to prison point so. I have a lot of siblings. Two older, one step sibling and two younger biologically and two younger adopted. Me and the older siblings share a father from my mom's first marriage and the younger from her second marriage. Anyway, all of us were enrolled in a nice private school because it was a rural area and the public schools were undesirable and also actually too far for public transportation. Around 7th grade though, my mom divorced her second husband and was single for a long time. She moved into the city and enrolled all of us, besides my oldest sibling who had graduated at this point and the step-sibling who lived with my dad and stayed in private school, into public school. Well, me and my stepbrother were thick as thieves. By the time my dad remarried I was only two and my stepbrother was the same age give a few months. We grew up being mistaken as twins and we were super close. Moving from a small private school that I went to with my best friend to a huge public school was super hard on me. I began failing classes and developed sever childhood depression. I could not acclimate to the change, though I did try. Eventually, my mom pulled me from public school and set me off to homeschool. It went horribly. She was working as a nurse and didn't have the time to tend me properly. I broke down one day and begged her to let me go back to my old school with my brother. I didn't understand why I couldn't at the time or why my mom seemed so upset, but as an adult now I do. The look on her face was one of a mother desperately wanting to make something impossible happen for her child point and she did. She started working more and more shifts. She moved us again, closer to my old school, and enrolled us all. She couldn't really afford it though. She started cleaning houses on the side. She also started slipping herself pills to keep awake to work all this time and still wrangle all of us kids. Eventually, she was caught stealing pills and fired. Her nursing license, which she'd dreamed of all her life and went to college late in life for, was suspended. She had a breakdown, and my grandma kept us for a few days. We ended up leaving private school again, and moving from home to home. Things progressively worsened as my mom spiraled into opioid addiction. The only job she could keep was cleaning houses, but that didn't pay all of the bills she started stealing. She was caught at a Walmart twice and finally tried for grand larceny, after she stole a lot of jewelry from a home she cleaned. It was definitely to pay for one of our Christmases she got 10 years, I like and I ended up dropping out of my senior year to keep four of my younger siblings. All because I wanted to go back to my old school with a brother I hardly talk to anymore. Because a year after I moved back, my dad and stepmom divorced and they moved to Florida. I set into motion a series of events that got the assistant manager fired at the liquor store I worked at. The assistant manager was an older hippie-ish guy and was our wine expert. He closed almost every night and was pretty chill to work with. I liked talking art, music, philosophy, and literature with him, though he did talk trash about other cowalkers behind their backs, which always made me uncomfortable. Well another cowalker I worked with, my junior in age, but senior in terms of work time and experience at the store who I also enjoyed chatting with, was pretty much the ideological opposite of the other guy. He's a real bro, who pumps iron, 
whose favorite movie might have been Top Gun, and is now a police officer. It was a year after the election, and Trump was following through with the things he said he would do, to the amazement of almost everyone, except those who voted for him, I didn't just so you know. And things started to get more tense at the store with each successive news story that came out. The immigration ban, building the wall, Rocketman Kim, the old hippie would express doom and the young bro would cheer. They started to get into little conversations and debates, and the bro would troll the hippie without the hippie realizing it. Then again there were times I wasn't sure how much was his real opinions were. But eventually it got to the point that the old hippie was too fed up and just started calling the bro an artsy. Bro decided to stop engaging with the old hippie. But it's already too late. Old hippie is in a frothing rage and convinced bros an artsy point so the old hippie starts talking to the store owner and main manager man trying to convince him to fire the bro. And I hear it, and despite my political differences with the bro, he's always stayed professional in the front of the store in front pf customers, works super hard, like even though the hip is the wine expert it's bro who does 95% of the wine work, and most importantly of all I consider him a friend. So of course, I hear this, and I shoot him a text, watch your back, hippers, on the warpath and he's gunning for you. As I would later learn, this was a mistake point bro asks another cowalker about what I mean, and they tell him, that hip is asking the bossman, to fire him point I'm there the day the rest of this happens, but I didn't witness everything, this is the best to my understanding, of what happened point bro then sidles up to hippie, while stocking wine and says, so I hear you're trying to get me fired, hippie forcefully pushes him, bro puts his hands up doesn't push back. Let's the hippie storm away. Hippie finds me redder in the face than I've ever seen anyone, and I don't remember everything exactly. But it goes something like this, did you tell bro, slash you told bro, I can't remember, if he merely accused me, or I confessed when asked, I hope you're happy, everything that happens after this is your fault, you've ruined everything. I'm pretty sure he also threw in a rhyme disappointed in you. I had to close with that man that night point from the hippie goes to the big boss demanding he fire the bro or he'll quit. Bossman does not respond to other people making demands of him well and says can't quit if I fire you. Because hippie pushed the bro and bossman had it on tape, there was no way he could side with hippie over bro. I find out that hip has come and gone in huffs before, but this time he's gone for good because bossman had had enough of his sheet. But he does tell me, I was never going to fire bro, I would have talked hippie around, or he would have eventually calmed down on his own, if you hadn't said anything. Now when he demanded I fire bro, or he quit I had to fire him, because I can't have people trying to make demands of me. Be careful to mind your business in the future, for a while afterwards customers would ask where hippie was, but now it seems like almost everyone hs forgotten him. Bro would fill in as wine expert in Hipper's place and take over most closing shifts. Almost exactly a year later Bro would be accepted into the police academy. A year after that the only non-cashier employee who's been at this job longer than me would quit. So that leaves me the senior stock and receiving associate for our store. I've towed the line close to getting an assistant management or key holding position, but I don't think the boss trusts me entirely enough and I don't exactly want all the responsibility. But even I will be moving on soon point my wife and I have bought a house, closer to her parents, and far for commuting to my current job, to be really worth it. So I'm scrambling for a job in the area of our new house, while also trying to raise and train a new puppy. Wish me luck, and next time you're drinking pour a splash of your favorite drink out for my fallen comrades TLDR. Told one cowalker an assistant manager wanted them fired, argument transpired that got the assistant manager fired. I'm late but will gladly contribute point summer of 2019, family decided to not go on vacation. Convinced my parents that, if they were to buy 10 scratcher tickets, and won a decent bit of money, very low chances, from them, that I would help contribute to the vacation and we could go. They accept. We win a couple thousand, yes I know, absolutely crazy, and decide to go to a beach house in Kill Devil Hills. Decide to pay for my friend to come with us. After a month of convincing he caves and wants to come. Very nice guy, because he did not want me paying for his expenses, but I could afford it. I was in a very good spot financially considering I had a vehicle which was mine, 
just not in my name for reasons we all know out there for car insurance things, had a stable job and large scholarship for university. So, we start out on the drive. I drive 8 hours from midnight to late am. Decide to let friend drive, because I was hella tired 20 minutes in. Car cuts off stepmom and that, we rear end them, and total my vehicle. All seems well though, considering initial estimates after the accident were granting me dollar sign 16k for it. Great. Vacation goes well besides that and all is well it seems. Parents decide since vehicle is in their name, although I paid for it entirely. That they get all the money, and that they are helping me by getting another vehicle for me with that money, only using dollar sign 7k. Decide that I have to pay them back the dollar sign 7k, even though I initially paid the dollar sign 14k for my vehicle, 2008 Jeep Wrangler, and got dollar sign 16k for the total vehicle. So now, after convincing them to go on a vacation they initially did not want to take, my vehicle that I nursed 4 years is totaled, I lose the initial dollar sign 14k, then lose the dollar sign 16k it was valued at, and then have to pay dollar sign 7k for this new one. I only recently turned 18, and so I have no way of claiming any money, since all papers were in their names for all vehicles. I was in great financial state, decided it would be fun for a vacation. Lose my pride and joy of a vehicle, and am now screwed out of tons of money, and am now in a financially horrible state. Thanks mom and dad. TLDR. Made parents buy scratches, win money, take vacation. Friend totals my car and parents steal dollar sign 23k from me, because no legal proof of anything ever being mine, or paid for by me. Went from 100 to 0 real quick. I did not set it off, but I'm directly linked to it, the guy who almost fatally injured my grandfather in the Korean War, saved my father from dying on 9 over 11 point my grandfather enlisted young, and was sent to Korea to fight. While fighting in the infantry, he was shot 6 times in the abdomen. He was left for dead, and was told by someone in the field, that they could only help people who had a chance of survival. Well. Someone picked him up, even though he was almost dead, and he woke up two weeks later on a hospital ship recovering. His wounds were really bad, from what I can recall, like half of his liver was gone, damage to the kidney, stomach, bowels, etc. but he was alive. Well, his injuries caused him to have lifelong pain and complications, because field trauma wound repair isn't always the best, which lead to his untimely death in 1999. My grandmother fell into a bout of depression because of this, we all did, obviously worse for her. A year later in 2000, my grandmother joined a retiree travel group and met a man who was a widower. They had a platonic relationship and enjoyed each other's company, but it was purely just platonic. He lived on the other side of the state, but later that year he moved in with my grandmother so they could travel more point this man was also enlisted, but in the navy. Even retired, he got up at 6am without an alarm clock to start his day, make coffee, do chores, etc. I had never once seen him sleep in. My father worked as a contractor for a company who had contracts with the military supplying military tech, it's a very prominent one. His location had meetings monthly at the Pentagon. Well, it just so happens that September's meeting is on 9 over 11 9 over 11 also is my little brother's first day of pre-kindergarten. My grandma's partner was going to pick him up from our house and drive him to school. The school was near my grandma's house, and my mom worked at the school I went to. But, that day, he slept in. This man is now in his 90s, and he still wakes up at 6am. On 9 over 11 he didn't. So my dad had to drive my brother to their house. Which caused him to take the late train into DC. Which caused him to take the late bus to the Pentagon point it was there in the Pentagon parking lot. That my dad watched a plane fly into the side of the building where his meeting was being held. Where all of his coworkers who were on time that day died. Except him point basically. This was before cell phones worked well and all the lines were down. And he had to walk 5 miles covered in ash before he could. Get on a bus. So my mom and I spent a good 6 hours thinking he was dead, because my mom knew where he worked at the Pentagon, and saw it happen on TV point but yeah, if my grandfather had not been injured, and died due to those injuries. 
My grandmother would have never met the man who always gets up on time who just happened to wake up late that day, setting a series of events which caused my father not to die on 9 over 11 point. If my grandfather had been saved, my father would have died. If he hadn't have had those complications, my dad wouldn't be here. My grandfather dying is what set off the sequence of saving my dad point I know it's not awful, but I do find it hard to rationalize because people always ask those questions like, if you could bring someone back to life, who would it be? Or if you could bring someone back for just a day stuff like that, like in icebreakers or get to know you activities. I used to always say my grandfather because I loved him and we had a great bond. It wasn't until I put this together in my early 20s did I realize that, by bringing my grandfather back to life, I would retroactively be killing my father at the same time, which is really weird to conceptualize and put me in one of those brain snowball moments. I've only shared this sequencing with my dad, who also found it incredibly morbid. I don't think I could tell my mom about how saving her dad would have killed her husband. Back in 2010 I was high as a kite and walking with a friend back to his place to get in some gaming. We ran into an old friend of his, a sweetheart girl, that I clicked with right away. I convinced my buddy to go to a local event with her to look at some art instead of gaming. He insisted we just head back, but I refused and went with her. Later that night I hooked up with that girl and started dating very soon after. She ended up pregnant with someone else's kid, but she had me convinced it was mine, and I dropped out of a very hard to get into education program. I was taking college courses at the local college, while in high school, both being taught at the college to start working. Threw everything away for this woman, a year later, and a lot of drama we were forced to move to Texas, I'm from New York, so that I could keep my son. Worked two jobs down there for two years before one day she left me, and when I tried going for custody requested a DNA test be done, which is when I found out the child wasn't mine. It destroyed me, and I took my last checks and greyhounded it back to New York to couch surf. The emotional spiral and heavy depression meant I didn't go back to school. Haven't left that stunt of depression yet, still haven't been back to school, and struggle finding work, yet my depression leaves me with so little ambition that I haven't bothered getting my jed, let alone any college degree, which is only amplifying things and making it worse on myself. I know this, yet I just don't have the drive to improve my life point I often wonder what world have happened if we left a few minutes earlier slash later and never came across that girl or if I'd had just listened to my friend and kept walking with him. The downfall of my mother's side of the family point backstory. My parents were in high school when my mom got pregnant with me. She was only 16. They had no idea what they were doing and my dad ran off and my mom got severely addicted to drugs. I was about 4 or 5 when my granny intervened and I had to start going to her house often during the week to get fed, bathed and cared for. I pretty much lived off of the kindness of other people and the scraps of strangers. And my sweet old granny when I got that rare chance. My mom ended up going to prison soon afterwards and I was shipped to another state to live with my grandparents. My memoir and papaw. At this time my memoir was just getting out of rehab for her addiction to hardcore drugs, and so this was really a new life for all of us. The first year was great probably the best year of my life. The following year my papaw, not blood related, but through the marriage of my memoir, started to sexually abuse me. I stayed with my grandparents for about 5 years, and with each year the abuse with my papaw worsened. At the same time, my memoir made my childhood the best it could have ever been. She had no idea this was going on, and I was so terrified at the time that I would have to go back to my shitty life that I stayed quiet. Point my memoir was super involved in every single aspect of my life. Without a doubt, she was my best friend for years. So many people in her life would speak about how different she was when she gained custody of me. That I was the light of her life, and she was the happiest she had been since she was young. She never raised either of her own two children because of her addiction to drugs, so I believe she handled me with such care because she felt like it was her second chance to do something good. Point the fourth year I was with my grandparents, my papa decided to move us to this very small town hours away from where we lived. 
and when I say small I mean population under 1000. I was already from a small area, but damn this was small point this is the first major turning point point my memo has asked me numerous times about moving before we moved and what my opinion was. The house we would live in was beautiful two stories, giant basement, five bedrooms, a garage, two sheds, a whole farm and an acre of land. We all fell in love with it. I told them I really wanted to move into this house, but I didn't want to leave my school and my friends in my town. I had rebranded this new place as my home, and I was truly in love with it, and didn't want to leave. However, I told my grandparents we should move, because of how happy this new house would make everyone. This was a horrible decision point the first week we were in the house we hadn't moved all of our furniture in yet. We blew up a giant air mattress, and we all slept on the floor for the first few nights in our new living room, until our things arrived. That first week my papa prowled on me right next to my memoir point the next morning I broke down. I told my memoir everything, and the entire family found out. It was humiliating, embarrassing and surreal. My memoir started a fight immediately, and threatened divorcing him, shouting, how could you at the top of her lungs. I don't remember every detail of that day afterwards, because I really just didn't want to remember it. Everything turned after this my memoir and papa hated each other after this. My papa told everyone I was a liar and my memoir was so disgusted with him, she couldn't stand to be around him. So many secrets had been exposed, and our family was a mess. No one wanted to be involved with me, or my grandparents, just because of the allegations and everyone was spiraling out of control point in the meantime, my dad had popped up. He had joined the military, gotten his life together, and was living in Florida. He invited me to come and stay the summer with him, and I jumped on this offer as quick as I could. I was way too eager to get away from the gigantic mess I was living in point this is the second major turning point and I think about this to this day. That summer, I decided to stay in Florida permanently. My dad had no knowledge of anything that was happening back home, and I told him I just didn't want to go back. I wanted to live in Florida and I wanted to spend time with my dad. My dad was awesome and he took care of me and did everything for me. I really did get the happily ever after I was looking for. Unfortunately everything I left behind crumbled. Bad point when I left my memo couldn't take it. She immediately got back on hard drugs and was taking pills and surrounding herself with horrible people. Her youngest daughter came to live with her to try and help with her but she, my aunt, has serious mental health problems and is also a raging alcoholic. So this only hurt the situation more. Soon after this, my memoir and papa we are fighting so regularly and severely about how their lives spiraled that my papa committed suicide. This really disrupted the family beyond belief. Fast forward to today, and my memoir and my aunt are serving 8 years apiece minimum in prison for trafficking meth across state lines. My memoir's life never recovered, and she is getting old now. She took me in when I needed someone the most and was so badly depressed when I left years later that she's rotting away in prison now. I've never forgiven myself for this the only highlight to this story is that 3 years ago my mom got out of prison for the second time and actually realized that things were so bad that something had to change. She just received her 3 year recovery coin and is doing better than I've ever seen her do in my entire life. I'm now living a great life too, supporting my family with my fiancé and our beautiful daughter. But the decisions I made will forever haunt me because of what happened to my family point seriously. If you took the time to read all of this then you're a champ. I didn't expect to type this much when I first started and then the keys got away from me. But this all actually happened to me and is a part of my life story point hell of a butterfly effect. I'm no storyteller. So I'll set the scene then transition into a bullet point style point my mother was an English professor from before I was born until she retired almost 15 years ago so it was only natural I would attend the school as tuition was waived and I could live at home saving even more money point IBM XT's had really just hit the market and were entering the schools of higher education circa 1986 which meant the school had just transitioned from using an HP 3000 as their primary computer for CS classes to the fancy new drab colored desktops with the fancy 5 inches floppy disks IBM Selectrix, most likely the third, were also replacing. 
typewrites as the norm, and one day during registration I handed a registration slip to my mom to sign which signed her up for a keyboarding class. And that sound you just heard was the flap of the wings she completed the course and the following term decided she would take one or more of her English classes to the computer lab to get them indoctrinated by writing a paper in the lab. I was free during the time and came along to help out in case someone needed help point at the end of the class a cute 5 feet 2 inches brunette wearing a white cotton blouse and long denim skirt flashed me a smile. Her name was Shannon Point now, before you think this is a love story, let me tell you, it's not Point I moved on to campus to live in the dorms the following year or the year after. Shannon and I ended up dating off and on over those next few years with ups and downs one evening I walked her to class and just outside the classroom was an 8 and 1 half inches x 11 inches yellow piece of paper with a recruitment announcement for something I had wanted to do when I was younger. Something entirely different than the CS degree I had been working towards for the prior 5 years the next term I enrolled in a single class which was focused on this new area point one day most of the class was discussing this test everyone was going to take point I had no idea what they were talking about but went with them along with the instructor to take the test in a large room with about 100 people the following week. We were mailed our results, and it turns out most people brought their results to the following class people were calling out numbers when finally the instructor stated they had received a 92 topping all others. I had kept my mouth shut, but then stated I received a 96 to which you could insert the bullshit scene from Top Gun Point. After producing my pink paper with the score on it, the class resumed point fast forward 6 months and I've gone through a multi-interview process, dropped out of school, moved 400 miles away, and have started a job. To this day I remember my first day on the job, and thinking to myself what the hell did I get myself into, several. Years into my new job I was dating slash living with my then girlfriend and her young daughter, when I finally had enough point I ran the finances, and, sadly, there was no way to cover all of our costs for less than $16 hour, minimum wage was about $4.25, this same scenario of wanting to call it quits played out again and again over the Yes, but financial obligations always prevented it point my first day on the job was 29.5 years ago and I've hated it for all but maybe 3 years simply because I handed my mom a piece of paper to introduce her to the modern age. I told my girlfriend that she should ask someone to sweethearts in our junior year even though I wanted her to ask me, but I wanted her to make her own decision, and I wanted to make it as clear as possible that I would go with her if she wanted to ask me, but she didn't have to. I accidentally made it sound like I didn't want to go, I really didn't care so no loss there, so she asked someone else point apparently the kid she asked really liked her, and the group she was in was full of his friends who also happened to be the most toxic and manipulative people on the planet. When they found out he liked her, they made it their new life goal to break us up and get those two together. They tried to get into her head, and they thought they did, when she started to lose feelings for me and liked this other kid instead. But it turns out that she was just feeding them empty lies to keep them from pestering her and only told them she was going to break up with me when she already knew she never was going to ever do that and because of how good of a liar and actor she can be they believed it point but the pressure still got to her head and she started acting different around me she lost herself and wasn't the same person i was in love with anymore we know each other like the back of our hands so it was impossible for her to keep what i thought was going on away from me and she accidentally convinced me that she really was gonna leave me for the other kid point intense anxiety started to ruin my life as I worried about her and what was going to happen to us. I stopped eating, sleeping, and getting any work done, and I actually ended up getting sick the weekend of sweethearts. After the dance the group realized that she was lying to them, and they planned a way to get into my head through a network of friends that would lead to my closest friends feeding me false information. They managed to convince me that she was gonna rent things that weekend, and it destroyed me even more. After days of living in what might be the worst state of my life, except for freshman and sophomore year, but we don't talk about those years, I realized something. Keep in mind that I was convinced that our relationship was doomed no matter what. 
so I decided that it would be better off to just let go myself and live in this miserable state for another 3 days as I waited for her to end it herself. So I broke up with her after school, neither of us having no idea what was really happening. It ended up working out though, cause my girlfriend and I are basically the same person and we were able to talk only 2 days after the breakup, and after seeing each other's point of view we picked apart the group's plan and realized how huge of a mistake we made. We became best friends again, and just like that everything was back to normal, for us at least. We are happy again, but the rest of the sweethearts group crashed and burned in dramatic fashion. One kid got so caught up trying to ruin our lives, that his girlfriend left him the very weekend my girlfriend said she would break up with me. A year later I heard he never recovered, and was arrested for illegal possession and distributing of marijuana. Another girl got used to the manipulation and turned her next relationship into one of the worst manipulative relationships I've heard of. And I don't know what happened to the boy my girlfriend went with, but I've heard that he's brushed up with the police a couple of times and has attempted suicide. I hope he got help point all that just because I didn't tell my girlfriend I wanted her to ask me to sweethearts. Cause I know if I told her she definitely would ask me. Damn. Mom hiding my cell phone led to two serious relationships including the woman I've been with for 7 years my mom hid my cell phone as a punishment and convinced me I lost it. She planned to give it back to me when the school year was over. I was in high school English and a teacher had confiscated a phone. It looked like one I lost so I stole it and planned to just say it was mine. I was a pose kid. I get told over the summer because of that incident I'd have to find another school to attend. I started the other school in my small town, and in the second semester, made two important friends George and Jeremy. George introduced me to my first serious girlfriend Michelle. Jeremy was my best friend. Turns out Michelle and Jeremy were actually cousins. After a year and a half I get dumped by Michelle, and start hanging out with Jeremy more. Jeremy's girlfriend is living with my current girlfriend. X broke up with me at the exact right time for me to enlarge my social circle enough that I show up as a person you may know on my current girlfriend's Facebook and she'd heard of me through mutual friends. She added me and we've been together since. We both originally went to the school I got kicked out of but never crossed paths oddly. We knew the same people, saw the same fights, but have no recollection of each other. Had I never had my phone taken from me, and had everything not happened exactly like it did I doubt we would have ever met. It's crazy to imagine how one cheaty decision 13 years ago led me to exactly where I am, and finding the woman I love. I used to sell LSD in high school. Since I started at a young age, I introduced acid to quite a few people. I was always careful when I sold it, making sure people weren't taking too many hits or taking hits too frequently. One night, three of my buddies decided they wanted to trip for the first time. We indulged and had a lovely time, and like most people, they wanted to trip again quickly. I reminded them time and time again that they should be patient with how often they trip. Point fast forward a few years, one of the buddies has taken a deep interest into psychedelics. He had a DMT and acid off the dark web a couple times, but I wasn't sure how consistent his habits were. Eventually I end up living with the guy. He's always been known to be the smartest of the group and a witty guy. While living with him, I could tell he began to dissociate more with each day. Especially when he started taking interest in astral projection point now to be honest, this was the most difficult year of my life. My patience began to shorten with each month, as he wouldn't clean up after himself, or keep up with rent. Eventually, towards the end of the lease, I got to the point of lashing out, and yelling at the guy, when he'd fall through. To this day, I've never expressed anger like this toward anyone else. The end of the lease was the end of the friendship. I confided in my other two friends, and they sided with me. Two years after the lease ended, we find out he was diagnosed with psychosis near the time of our lease together. We've tried to reconcile on multiple occasions, but we cannot seem to break through. We hope that with enough patience, we can help rebuild his character by hanging out completely sober. He is no longer the same person, and I cannot help but think of the first trip that may have determined this path. I, 15 going on 16. Had a friend named Cam. 
he was really into D&D and wanted to start a D&D roleplay group chat on kick. I had always been interested, but too scared to be social in real life, so I decided to join. What's the worst that could happen? It ended up being us two, my friend Cass and her girlfriend Audrey, a guy named Spencer and a dude I had never met before. As we were setting up characters new dude decides he wants to get to know me, and we text in our own chat. I was hyped, and decided I only had two friends, it wouldn't hurt to make a new one right. We talked for less than a week, before we met up in real life. We start dating, and I found out he was the dwarf guy at my school. We started dating, and he changed classes to be with me. He because super abusive and always grabbing me sexually, and tried to force himself on me the couple times I was at his house. He would cut himself, if I didn't send nudes, and sent video slash picture proof so now even in my very healthy relationship I feel like, if I'm not sexual enough my current boyfriend doesn't love me, and I'm a bad girlfriend. He also had severe mental issues, and had 21 different personalities self-diagnosed of course. He spent many weeks in a mental institution, but always came back to school. He ended up making me lie to the school, to try and get CPS involved, and have me sent to live with him. I dk how he thought that would work, when my mom was pregnant, and had three other kids living with us. CPS came and nothing happened. He would beat on me, if I told him to leave me alone, but because he was short everyone said I was lying. I'm a big girl, so I became a laughing stock, when I got the school involved. School put in an in-school no contact contract. He avoided it several times, but got off with a warning, because nobody wanted to say they saw it. He would send people after me, and my life was threatened, so I hid in a bathroom stall most of my last two years of high school, if I wasn't in class. One day he finally just stopped messing with me. At graduation I found out it was because he had convinced a freshman that he was depressed because he was a virgin and was using her for sex. When her parents found out they went off because he had pictures of he naked still on his phone. Then he moved on to a girl in our grade and tried to convince her that he needed love because he wanted to kill himself. She basically told him to fuck off and had to get a no contact order as well. I only talked to one person from high school, Cass, now and it's only a year later. Almost two and a half years since I was in that mess. I have no idea what happened to the guy and honestly only care because I know he won't stop and I'm scared for his next victim point basically. If I had never decided to try D&D I wouldn't have had this happen and the other two girls and ones I don't know about wouldn't be hurt. This question was made for me. This instantly drew me in, because I have such a strong connection with the butterfly effect. I used to hate butterflies. Now I adore them. When I was about 12 or 13, my grandma took my little brother and I to a butterfly farm. While we were there my grandma answered a phone call and started to cry. I knew something bad had happened. She proceeded to tell me that my mom was in a very bad accident. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday, my mom was hit at 60 miles per hour in a 25 miles per hour zone by a drunk driver. The only reason she was out was to get cigarettes. If my brother and I hadn't gone to the butterfly farm, we may have died. She would have took us to get them, as we were too young to stay home, and my dad was at work. I would have been in the front, where I was way too young to be sitting, and my brother would have been in the back left seat exactly where the guy hit my mom as well as where his cooler full of beers flew through the window, and would have hit him in the head. My mom survived with bad injuries, and needed many surgeries on her neck, but needless to say she quit smoking. I hated butterflies. They reminded me of a time, where I thought I was losing my mom. She told me that the accident was a sign for her to stop, as if she hadn't needed cigarettes she wouldn't have left the house. With all this butterfly talk, and the fact that we were physically at a butterfly farm when we got the news. Sheesh, how could I not believe in it point I've had so many experiences since then, but I grew to love butterflies I've actually got a tattoo of a butterfly that says boom. Butterfly effect right under it. My favorite tattoo, and I admire it every day point but hey, TDLR don't drink and drive, stop smoking, tell your loved ones you love them. Once I took down most of our production systems by accidentally muting an alert for 24 hours instead of 5 minutes. 
if I see high utilization on our host site typically keep an eye on it for like 15 minutes, it's nearly always a short spike. But I hit the wrong button without realizing it, and moved on to other sheet points so a rescue LVM that was incorrectly configured started sucking up more and more resources, until it started taking down important sheet, which I saw in different ways, like our business critical systems flipping the fuck out, and people calling me telling me everything was broken point it was a very long night. My line of work means I see a lot of small things like that turn into big things. Our infosec guys put a tap on our main aggregator, and it throttled the bandwidth down to a fraction of what it should have been, so every day at exactly 5pm important processes would start to fail, because we run a lot of sheet at the end of the business day. It would all come up, after about 15 minutes our monitoring left a lot to be desired at the time and we couldn't figure out why. It was two months before we figured it out, because at the time we allowed Infosec to pretty much do what they pleased in regard to security, and despite hounding them for months they swore up and down they hadn't done anything, that could cause the issue point lots of other examples, but those are a couple of the biggest headaches I've had in this job caused by a single mistake. This is actually a really positive butterfly effect thing, but when I was 16 to 17 I saw a post on Facebook looking for voice actors for a fun animation project for YouTube. I applied and got in. Now this group was about 10 people incorporated me, 8 Americans, and me and this guy who were from the UK point the project was quite poorly managed, and I ended up quitting when I got in an argument with the person in charge, but because I'd made friends with the other English guy, he decided to leave the project with me. Eventually I started dating this guy, we'd been in a long distance relationship for about a year and half. He lived in North England and I lived in the South, and it came time for me to choose the university I wanted to go to. I ended up choosing the one he was attending, about 2 hours from my home, and wouldn't you know it, he broke up with me about 2 weeks, before I was supposed to move up there for university point well. I'm no beach. I moved up to the university anyway. I thought I might as well, uni is uni right. I'd been there for about 5 months, and was having trouble sleeping. It was 2am, so I had the TV on in my room really quiet and an advert for a harmony comes on the TV. So as a spur of the moment thing I decided to give it a go. I messaged the guy, let's call him scene, on there, and we ended up chatting all night. He lived 30 minutes away from the uni, and a couple weeks later he came to visit me. He drove, I hadn't got my license at that point. After another couple months, I decided to drop out of university. Instead of moving all the way back home, two hours back south, Scene invited me to come and live with him for a while until I figured out what to do. I ended up living with him up there for a year, until we moved back south together. It's now been nearly three years, Scene and I have a flat together, and are very happy point sometimes I think, if I'd never seen that voice acting ad on Facebook that day, maybe none of this world have happened, but I'm so grateful it did. One of my good friends who had never tried gaming before decided she wanted to try to bond with her younger brothers more because family is very important to her and now that they were all adults they were finding it hard to keep up with family. Well, she eventually got an Xbox and started playing a game called Destiny which her brothers loved playing at the time. They eventually moved on to Fortnite and laugh out loud but she stuck with Destiny because she had made some good friends on it. Well, she kept talking about this game for months, and about her friends she made, and said I would get along with them a lot. I've been a gamer, since I could walk, but I've never been into online games or shooters, terrible aim, and social anxiety, but one day we were out on a girls night with some other friends, and stopped into GameStop. I found a copy of Destiny for $7 and thought, okay fine, and told her I would buy it, so she and I could play together, and have more opportunities to chill, since I was moving soon for school. Well, first day I played with her she pulled me into a party with her buddies and wow it was a lot to handle. There was a ton of them, but they were all so nice, and walked me through the story and I actually got really close with them as well. My friend actually moved on to another group. So I rarely played with her, but ended up playing with her old group every day. I became best friends with one of the guys in the group, who I got very close to. He was in college, and had some roommates, and occasionally one of his roommates would watch him play, and the three of us would chat while me, and my friend would play Destiny. 
Fast forward through the summer and once school started again, and my friend lets roommate hop on the mic and actually play. He begged me to play with his roommate because he doesn't have many friends, and he wanted roommate to get in his box to play with us. Me and roommate wound up playing until 4am, about 12 plus hours, and I gave him my number. We started talking every single day. That was in the end of September. They went to school a couple hundred miles away from me, but it turns out roommate had lived only 30 minutes from me for almost our entire lives. That December he baked me a cake and brought it to my house for Christmas. The following March we had our first date. In the next September he asked me to be his girlfriend after dating for the summer. Now, almost two years later, we are so in love and are planning on being married. All because my friend decided she wanted to get closer with her brothers and try out gaming. Weird turn of events, if you ask me. I guess, in a way, it was destiny. Decided to see if plenty of fish was any good after my first boyfriend with a microbonus broke up with me, and it led to six years of mental torture, three abortions, rap and two years of homelessness I was 19, and had just moved to New York City to be an AU pair. I was dumb and naive, and wanted a boyfriend. I started talking to a guy on there, we decided to go on a date on August 2nd, 2009. It was the best date of my life. Why not the rooftop garden looking out on the Hudson, saw a jazz show at the Village Vanguard, took the L to Williamsburg for some pizza. I was hoaked. Let's call him X we didn't date for long, but while we were dating we had started creating a comic book together. He was the writer, and I was the illustrator. One day I came over, and he broke up with me. Found out over Facebook X had already started faking this Wikiputo Rick and slash Dominican girl whose a slash boob to waist ratio was ever so slightly better than mine. I had already agreed to keep making the comic book with him, but this hurt me so deeply. I'm aware that I could have avoided a lot of this by not being so goddamn naive, but I grew up in the Bible Belt and didn't have much relationship experience. Point the French family I was working for as an AU pair had a beautiful five story brownstone, but my room was a tiny loft on the top floor between a balcony and rooftop garden. I had no door, so their cats would come in all the time. My bed was just a bench with three cushions. One day I came home and noticed one turned over. I flipped it to find cat sheet smeared on it. I told Dex about it, and he told me I could sleep on his couch instead. I took him up on it, because his high-rise apartment in Battery Park City seemed better than a cat sheet cushion on a bench. X and I got along when brainstorming the comic, but he was very open about the girls he was pursuing and it hurt. I was not emotionally mature. I admit that point fast forward 3 years. We moved to California, to be closer to Comic Con. He had previously tried to kick me out after the wine store in Tree BK I worked at fired me. I was a good employee, and I was blindsided, after mentioning to the owner, that I might be moving. X's dad told him rent was getting too expensive in his building, and that he couldn't stay in New York City. I had been looking for rooms to rent for myself, after he told me he was kicking me out, but after his dad threatened to make him move home he begged me to stay with him, and move to California. So I did point we started, having such again on our two week road trip from New York City to California. What a mistake. I will be honest, I initiated most of the search. I was lonely and such felt good, so I wanted it. He would go back and forth between we never even dated to if you just make more comic books I'll be with you. All of this stupid search led to me getting pregnant. Why wasn't I on birth control? Because I didn't have a job. He was a full time job. Clean cook, take care of the dog, suck his dick, tell him he's a genius writer, assure him that 5ft5 isn't too short. By the time I was meant to draw the comics I was mentally and emotionally exhausted, which just gave him a reason to start verbally abusing me. I was a fuck up, I never drew him anything, I drew him 9 comic books, I was fat, I was stupid, I was ruining his chances to get with girls, I could go on forever, so I'm pregnant for the first time I want to put it up for adoption, but he forces me to have an abortion, because no child of his is going to be out there without him. Fine. I have the abortion. I start taking birth control, because Medical provided it to me for free. He was my ride to get it, and about 3 months after I start taking it, he just stops giving me a ride to pick up the prescription. 
We keep having sex. I understand how stupid I was. I'm not innocent here. But a part of me so desperately wanted all these years to have been worth something. A few months later I get pregnant again. Another abortion. One month later I get pregnant again. Another abortion. I'm so faking sick of the abortions and knowing he won't take me to get birth control I stop having sex with him. I'm terrified of getting pregnant again point over these 5 years he has gotten progressively more abusive. Verbal abuse, financial abuse, gaslighting. I got to the point that I was so nervous around him, I lost the ability to talk properly and developed a stutter. I couldn't place words correctly which led to him telling me even more often that I was faking stupid. He became an all about not touching anything dirty. I had to mop the floor 10 times a day. I couldn't touch anything of his unless I took a shower. He wouldn't pick up his phone because it was dirty so when I was out getting food, groceries, at work, etc. He wouldn't respond and then he'd be verbally abusive when I got home without something he wanted. Point I was no longer naive. I had no sexual interest in him. He was a monster. He was mentally unwell. He started master baiting and letting his ejaculate land on the dishwasher door over and over. It was caked on there. I cleaned his faking cum off of that dishwasher door every day. He started doing it on the wall and only stopped because I told him he was ruining the paint point he had known the entire time that I was bisexual. Once I was no longer interested in him and we hadn't had sex in over a year I started talking to a girl online. We hit it off and started dating a few months later. She was about 7 hours away so I didn't see her much. I didn't tell him about it until she came to visit and we stayed in a hotel for the weekend. He was determined to ruin anything that brought me joy so I kept her to myself. It was my one safe, happy moment in the day when we would talk. I had been working as a luxury apartment cleaner in LA for a few months and over those months I spent less and less time at the apartment. He didn't suspect anything until she came to visit point. When he asked who she was, I told him the truth. X and I weren't dating, and in his past words, had never dated, so what was the harm in me seeing her? He flew into a rage. He yelled, he cried. He told me he loved me, and that I had to give him a chance. Let me remind you that he is not mentally well so much, so that I hid the knives in my room every night, because I didn't trust him to not hurt himself. I was scared that he would do something, so I told him I'd give him a chance. He took me out almost every night for a few weeks. He would get cheat faced every time. He would try to have sex with me every time. I kept telling him no. One night after he drank too much again he asked again. I said no. He told me I owed it to him and that he would kick me out if I didn't. It was midnight and we lived in little Tokyo right where the border of Skid Row started. I was scared that if I was out there something worse would happen to me. At least I knew him and knew he didn't have diseases or that he'd hurt me. He started yelling again that he would kick me out and that he wasn't going to wait anymore. I froze and let it happen. I just wanted it over. He was so drunk and was saying the most disgusting things during it. He wanted to hurt me. He told me how gross my hair used to be when I bleached it. How if I got a tummy tuck I'd look just like a born star. I was numb and just laid on my side while it happened point. After he finished I texted my best friend that I desperately needed help and absolutely had to get out of the situation. She was moving to the city where my new girlfriend lived and said if I stay with my girlfriend and her family until she got there in two weeks I could couch surf for a while point the next day he didn't even remember what happened. He said he blacked out. That night he made me go out with him again. I started crying at the table because I couldn't stop thinking about what happened. He got furious and sent me home. I was laying in bed crying when he got home. He said he just wanted to lay with me, not have sex. So I let him. I didn't really have an option. Our apartment had these beautiful sliding frosted glass doors their only floor was that you couldn't lock them. I stayed still for a while but then needed to go to the bathroom. I got up and went to my bathroom and slid the door shut. I started going to the bathroom and then I hear him yelling. He's screaming get the fuck out. Get out. Get the fuck out, you beach. He flings my bathroom door open and grabs me by both my upper arms and pulls me off of the toilet. 
It was so faking humiliating to stand there with sheet in the toilet while he's shaking me and screaming in my face. I grabbed his forearms and dug my nails in as hard as I could to get him to let me go. I said fine. I'm happy to leave, which made him even more upset. He screamed in my face the entire 10 minutes he let me pack my back point I stayed in the building's lobby until 6am. My girlfriend told me she got me a train ticket for 11am. I was finally going to be free. I knocked on his apartment door at 6, only because I wanted a shower and to sleep for a few hours. He once again remembered absolutely nothing that happened. At 10.30am I grabbed my bag and walked right past him and out the door. He started freaking out that I was leaving for good six faking years I stayed. But now I'm gone. I had only that bag I took with me and it took me two years to get a good enough job to afford a tiny studio. I slept in my car in broken down black mold campers on multiple couches. Now I'm finishing my degree in economics, I live in a beautiful house with my two friends and a dog, and I'm happy knowing that sick son of a beach has two sets of half moon scars on his arms from my finger nails digging and pointer is going to clean up his come off the dishwasher door now. I ran my first full marathon in May 2015 and had actually stuck to the training program well enough that I didn't really experience the late race challenges I'd often heard about. A friend of mine posted on Facebook about a 50k he was doing 6 weeks later, so I decided to give it a try point as an aside. I almost couldn't go to the race, I'd requested it off for work, and it was granted, but then someone else had a major medical emergency. I allowed myself to be a bit of an asshole and push to keep the off day, even though it meant borrowing someone from another location. I ended up quitting that job a few months later. Glad I pushed for it, the day arrives, and it's been raining almost non-stop for 4 days, and it's raining at the time. Course is miserable, puddles turning into lakes, caked on mud, about as many mosquitoes per area as Bangladesh has people, just all around poor conditions. Much of the field nft, myself included. After the race I got to talking with other people who shared the experience. I'd gone 3 loops of 5, so 30k, and I was talking to a woman who'd attempted the 50 meters, 8 loops and a bit, but only could do 2 loops. Commiserate a bit on the event's Facebook page, I add her, we keep talking, she mentions going to a local trivia to no one in particular, status on her feed, and I inquire as to the trivia. We decide to go, but instead set up a plan to meet for a run around a nearby lake and drinks for and one half years later we are planning our wedding. Went to see two of my favorite bands perform live together. Ruined my undergrad GPA forever when I was about two semesters away from graduating. My favorite band went on tour with my second favorite band. Not wanting to miss the opportunity to see both together, I immediately bought tickets for the city closest to my college town, about a 2.5 hour drive, even though the show would be on a Wednesday night, and I was a full time student. I made plans with a friend who lived in the city, booked a hotel room for the two of us, and set it up to be an awesome time and it was. However, I skipped all my classes on that Wednesday, so I could drive out there. I luckily didn't have Thursday classes. I had a poem due in my upper level poetry workshop on that Wednesday and I assumed that I could turn it in when I returned on Friday. Because this was a poetry class, this poem was a huge chunk of my grade. I neglected the part of the syllabus where my professor specified that she didn't accept late work, except under extreme circumstances. Obviously, skipping class to go to a concert is not an extreme circumstance. Had I written it ahead of time and emailed it to her, my grade would have been fine, but I finished the class with a be all because of that missing poem. Fast forward to my final semester. Graduation is approaching. I do all the math I can, and with that be in poetry, the best I can pull out with is a 2.9 GPA point one tenth of a point. Had I gotten an A in that class, I would have had well above a 3.0, which is the baseline GPA for a lot of graduate programs. I know I messed up a lot freshman year, which is why it was lower than average in the first place, but man, that one poem faked me. I was 23 I shunned in college. I was drinking at a bar one night and ran into a guy who I had multiple previous conversations with. He tells me about him climbing this old tower in an abandoned amusement park in town. 
After a couple drinks, more conversation and the bar closing down for the night, he asks if I'm up to go climb the tower that night with him. I agree. So we ride our bikes down to the abandoned amusement park. Slide under the fence. Walk up to the tower, which is about 200 feet tall or so. We climb into the tower and proceed to climb to the top using some ladders inside. We drink a few beers up top and decide to head down after a couple hours since it was getting to be early morning and the sun was about to rise. I go home and go to bed point I wake up late morning just before noon decide to ride my bike down to the coffee shop that acts like a main hub where all of my friends would hang out, smoke cigarettes, tell stories and heckle the frat boys. A few of my friends are hanging out on the patio and I tell them about my previous night's adventure. A couple of them were asking questions about the logistics of the tower. I tell them everything. The day goes on and everything is good, no work or school, doing the normal college kid stuff. I go to bed semi early that night due to hangover and a late night climbing the tower. I wake up the next morning for school, but with a stop at the same coffee shop, and as I'm pulling up I notice it isn't the same antics as it usually is and everybody is crying. They proceed to tell me about our buddy, who was listening into my story, and about the logistics, had gotten drunk the previous night, and decided to go climb the tower. He climbed up to the top eagle nest area, and was drinking beers. Someone from the surrounding neighborhood, called the cops on him. The cops showed up, and ordered him to come down. On his descent something happened, and he fell to his death point I know it wasn't my fault, but I feel, like it was something I influenced without a doubt. Like what if I never mentioned it to that group of people the morning after I climbed it? Would he still be alive? Hard to say but it's weird having something you said influence someone to do something that would lead to their death. I'm 32 so it's been about 10 years since and I think about it a few times a year I don't know if this is necessarily a butterfly effect to the fullest but my conversation influenced him to climb the tower which lead to his death. I need to remind myself that my actions and conversations can have the power to change someone's life. It could be for the better as well, but this time in specific it was definitely not for the better the city decided to tear down the tower a couple weeks later due to his death. It was an amusement park that hadn't been operational for a couple decades or IP. So as to stay on topic, I would not be alive today if I didn't have something. Somebody who is no longer in my life to live for at the time of its occurrence. I have never had that occurrence before at any point in my life, nor were the signs, indications, or a familial history of it happening. Literally an out of the blue experience point anyway. I always think about the effects, short term to long reaching, that a choice can have. Always point they say there's no use in pondering the what ifs, but because of this concept, why shouldn't we? Every second, every breath counts. Every time you delay someone, every time you speak, every time you do something you shouldn't be doing, you are affecting countless lives through your actions it's another small reason, a small part of why I get angry at cheaty drivers. Their selfishness might delay another driver or driver's seconds to minutes of their lives, seconds, or minutes they could be spending doing something important point it's why I get so angry when people waste my time, or waste their own time for me, in the sense that their actions weren't thought through and ultimately worthless to me. You could have used your time for yourself, or to completely think through slash research whatever you were going to do and do it right, or at least get as close to right as the situation might call for. I'm not a it's the thought that counts kinda guy, and this makes me stick out among people I know like a sore thumb apparently the socially normal thing to do is say thank you, accept the gift you're never gonna use, and throw it away when they're not looking, and perhaps wait for the right time sometime down the road to tell them to stop doing those things for you, in order to spare their feelings, of course. My thoughts on the matter, just because you feel like doing something, doesn't mean you should do that thing immediately. Doesn't mean you even need to do something. Find out what you can or should do first remember, communication is important, and asking questions, asking the right questions, pertinent to the situation, is key point I think a lot of people have the concept of thinking about the consequences of their actions wrong or other, incomplete. They tend to think of problem to consequence as 1 to 1 ratios and that's it. Not problem to consequence x4, plus hidden consequences they couldn't perceive of. Then there's always the smaller choices they make, 
that they don't think anything of the reason this thread exists tldr small choices have consequences that a great amount of people don't normally perceive on a day-to-day -day basis and this bothers the ever-loving crap out of me and those like me because it's completely and utterly selfish point down vote edit i'm baffled to be quite honest Maybe they just don't like my opinion on the matter. My dad was born in a small city in central Java, Indonesia. He has a small bicycle shop there and was building a new car reparation shop. So he goes back home every month to check how things are going. During that time, he happened to accidentally step on a rusted nail. So he infected tetanus he rushed to the doctor, but the doctor suggested him to wait for quite some time to get the injection as the ones in his hometown aren't as good as the ones in the capital city where we live. So he decided to wait a few days as he was planning to get back home the day after tomorrow. That was a big mistake. A few weeks after that he ended up having to amputate his toe as he was suffering from diabetes. Not to mention, during the time of the accident his blood sugar level was quite high, so it messed his metabolism and the wound could not heal properly. Point long story short, he had heart complications after that. We seeked a doctor in Indonesia, but he was shitty and wanted to experiment on my dad because there was this new machine that could control one's valve or something. So we ended up having to go abroad, which the doctors mentioned that the machine was no use to his case and is actually much simpler than that, although it was a lot of diseases in one. He was getting better after a few months of intensive treatment point so he decided to go back to his hometown to check on the shop again. He met with all his extended family as I think it was a little after Lunar New Year. He got back home, spent time with me and my mom for a while. He passed away that night while talking to my mom. TLDR dad got tetanus, but was too late in treating it resulting to his amputation and heart complication to trigger. Then he passed away not long after.